Welcome back to the Ice Coffee Hour. Mm -hmm. This podcast, educated guest this time, has made two hundred and three thousand dollars. Getting closer, two hundred and thirty-three thousand. Well, I got it pretty much dead on. Eight hundred sixty-six. Yeah, <laughs> just minus the three. <laughs> Great guess. That's, yeah, you've made fifty thousand dollars since I've been here last. Has really? No. Has it really been? I swear it was one eighty yeah. when I was here last. Solid. Wow. We'll take it. Where did the money it? go, Jack? I have no idea, man. <laughs> it's been three months. Has it really? You guys. Wow. I'm going to start a podcast. That's not bad. Great you business. should, man. People yeah. love you because we had you on last time yeah. with the video titled something like The Man Who Owns 100 Lamborghinis, Lamborghinis for a hundred or for $10 million. Yeah. And you were telling yeah. us about your stories and how you rented out these supercars to yeah. these people and they would crash them. It would be a huge liability issue. And I know you've been recently trying to get out of the uh, the car rental, the luxury, sorry, not get out of it, but your, expand your horizons yeah. into other now businesses. Now I'm the man with 10 million chickens. 10 million tickets. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, it's funny. Uh, uh, Daniel Mack came up next to me in my Koenigsegg and, uh, you know, asked me what I do for a living. And I was yeah. like, I just sell chicken now. And, and he just, it, it was actually a pretty funny story, but uh, he didn't understand it, you know? And I thought it was actually really cool because that means I'm doing something right. Mm -hmm. You know, like when someone doesn't get what you're doing, then you're doing a good job, you know? Yeah. So renting cars is becoming oversaturated. And like insurance and just so many little things are becoming just too much. Mm -hmm. Honestly, like it, I just don't see a path how this business exists in five years. So transitioning into, you know, chicken was the only way I saw a way to like continue to monetize my skill set, right? And and grow to a level to where we're international or you know just national is is good enough. But uh, that business, you can just drop one anywhere, right? Like. We've got a thousand plus franchisee applications now, and we're getting them um, all over the world, right? We have like Flagstaff, Arizona with 73,000 people. And we have like the United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia. I mean, you just name it, people mm -hmm. wanna put one there. And like when I started to have the idea to maybe franchise royalty, it was Miami, LA, that's it. I so, believe that, yeah. You know, it's right. like, there's not really much you can do with yeah. that business. Now that business is sexy. Right. Everybody wants not very many people have unlimited supercar power. Right. I mean, that was kind of one of the things that made me popular. Right. Is the ability to just drive any car at any time. And funny enough, I never drove my rental cars. I, I always had this weird anxiety that they'd be like dirty or something, mm. you know, which they're not. But like, I don't know. Really? It's, it's kind of like. Well, let's talk about the rental car business. First of all, how has that industry evolved? How has Turo impacted it? And why are insurance rates going up so much? Why are we hearing about this auto bubble? Well, luckily, um, Turo hasn't impacted my particular business because my particular price point of cars isn't really on Turo. Every once in a while, someone throws a Lamborghini up there for like 700 bucks. Mm. But that doesn't affect me, you know? Um, but it affects everybody else. Um, Turo, I think, don't hold me to this, but they have between like five and 10 million members. Right, that's not that many people when you think about a nationwide amount of members, right? I mean, over 30 million people come to Las Vegas every year and rent a car. Mm. So th there's a very large number of people that are renting cars that have no idea what Tour is, you know. <laughs> but in general, the rental car industry is is becoming oversaturated because of things like Turo, because of the price points, right? Hertz and Avis and myself, we know what it takes to rent the car, right? The late, your next door neighbor that has three cars on Turo has no idea what it takes to rent the car. She knows what her payment is, and she knows how much she needs to make every month to make mm -hmm. that payment. And that's her goal, is to make that payment, maybe more, to make her other car payment that she's not renting, yeah. right? And so that's why Turo is a problem, because of people not understanding the business model behind renting cars, right? They're just looking to just kick the can down the road. And this is exactly what happened with the auto loan bubble that everybody's talking about right now, right? It's like the mortgage crisis in 07, 08, 09, right? The only reason someone bought a car or bought a house was because they thought someone else would pay more. Like, didn't matter what it was. If they got approved, they'd buy it. Mm -hmm. And so because the car market was going up so fast, everybody was like, oh, I'd buy a G-Wagon because I'm not going to lose money, right? If it's 50 over sticker, 100 over sticker, they're not gonna lose money because they think that the cars are gonna keep appreciating in value because of the low production, or there's an issue in you know uh, getting chips and all these little things. It's a lot of excuses. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you looked at Ford's inventory, 
I mean, they had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cars sitting in parking lots, right, waiting for chips. Yeah. While they're but does it matter what car it is? Like, let's just say you're guaranteed to buy a Ferrari, a new Ferrari at MSRP a year from now. Would that be a good deal to take over, let's say, a Lamborghini at MSRP versus like a McLaren at MSRP? Well, what are your thoughts a year from now? You're definitely not going to buy a McLaren at MSRP because those, the, the, if you're buying one at MSRP, you're getting a bad deal. <laughs> so, because they go under MSRP <laughs> very quickly. Yeah. And even in this environment, ma- manufacturers like Aston Martin and McLaren still depreciate it. Mm-hmm. So, sucks to be them. Wow. Yeah. Um, Ferraris always are were limited because they make less than 10,000 cars a year. So, Ferraris did a really good job of always limiting their production for two reasons. Um, a, because they don't make. Um, very uh, widely used cars, right? They, they make a very niche car for a very niche person, right? So like their mid-engine V8, you know, the current F8 model or yeah. the, the new 296, those are the most widely used cars. But like their GTC4 Lusso and, you know, the 812, they're very niche. And so those cars always appreciate over time because Ferrari actually sells out majority of their production line before they really release the car. And so they do that because, well, they, they want the orders, so that they can get the customers and maybe the car isn't up to their standards or it's not kind of that good. People Mm -hmm. are still committed to buy it. And Ferrari buyers are scared to not buy the next car because they're, they're afraid that they won't get the car after that. Right. So it's this kind of mantra that Ferrari's got like their customers wrapped around their finger, Mm -hmm. which is a good thing. So if you're going to get a Ferrari MSRP, yes, it's great. But that Ferrari actually comes with a two year, like no sale clause. So you sign a paper saying you're not going to sell this to anybody except the dealer who sold it to you for two years. And if you do do that and you sell the car before that to someone else, you'll never be able to buy a Ferrari again. Because if you buy the Ferrari and I'm the dealer, right? Let's say you paid 300, mm-hmm. the car's worth 400. I'm going to give you 320 and I'm going to sell it for 400, right? And so you make 20,000 bucks, which is a minuscule amount of money in comparison to the value that you inputted for the car. So that particular brand's really unique. Sure. But like Lamborghini, I mean, they're making an SUV that's doing $100,000 over sticker. You can just go and order one of those and they don't care if you sell it the next day, right? And so that's why the cars are so increasingly, you know, transacted, right? So they, mm. they're doing a really good job of that. But that's changing. I mean, just in the last two weeks, I mean, for instance, I purchased an Aston Martin DBX, which is the SUV, right? And that car was around $240,000 new. This car had 5,000 miles. And it had um, basically some just it like blew a tire and it like the, the fender kind of got messed up a little bit, mm. right? I purchased it for $125,000. And the value of the car when I bought it was 170,000. I fixed it. And a dealer had offered me 165000 And so I agreed to sell it to wow. them. Within that two-week period of me fixing the car and getting all that done, by the time I was able, two weeks, the car was worth one hundred and forty grand. So yesterday, I sold the car for 140000 In two weeks, it dropped literally yeah. over 15% of its value like that. Why? Is that because of the market going down? Exactly. That's because yeah. your bubble popped. That's the problem. The bubble, once the bubble pops, it's like, people's mentality changes, right? So kind of like similar to what's happening to real estate right now. It's like, how low can we get this, right? Not how much money can we make on it? It's like an opposite approach to like buying the car. So that dealer and every dealer is lowballing me, lowballing me, lowballing me, lowballing me, saying, you know, one guy will offer 140, one guy will offer 145, one guy will offer 130, and someone's just gonna see who bites, right? Mm. Before it was, let's get closest to the, what I can sell the car, so I can get the auxiliary items, the financing and the tire protection and the dealers would make their money on the after sale products. Now they're back to trying to rip the cars from the customers because there's an overabundance of cars available. Mm. So that's the, the the difference in the bubble. Yeah, where do you think it's gonna end up? I mean, the, the end is is probably very close to, to becoming, the start of the end is probably very close. You know, if, if, if it starts with one car, like the G-Wagon, for instance, mm-hmm was doing 150,000 over a sticker. So now dealers are asking 50,000 over a sticker. These are for brand new ones. If you have miles on them, it's less, right? So it dropped 100,000 in a month and it's gonna continue to drop because the demand, like for me and for you, if you knowingly are gonna buy a car that is gonna depreciate $50,000, you have to either A, really want that car, like it's your dream car for the rest of your life and you're never gonna sell it, or you have to be kind of like not that smart, 
you know? And so there, there isn't that many customers that fall in the middle of that, Yeah. right? Or the people who just don't care. Like 50 grand for them is like a penny. Yeah, but those people already bought the cars. Yeah. They don't go out and buy 10 more G-Wagons. Like how many customers don't care? And how many customers can you get to trade in the G-Wagon that they bought last year for the new one that they don't care about losing money for, <laughs> for the next one and the next one and the next one? Yeah. The car is the same, well, different color maybe. So like those customers that have the $6 trillion that was free for our economy, they spent that money and now that money's gone, mm -hmm. right? So they paid a million over for a house. They paid a hundred thousand over for a car. Now they have all this stuff, right? What are they gonna do with it? You know, they if they want new stuff, they're gonna sell it cheap, right? To go get the other cheap stuff or it's just a revolving circle. Yeah. Big problem is in your car rental companies when they, when they went and bought everything for auction value, they have to replace those cars, you know? So they're gonna, they're gonna devalue the market the most, mm. right? Because they have, you know, some of these companies have 100,000 cars, right? So think about 100,000 of the same model cars going through auction that just start to drop the value, right? right? And that's where like the biggest problem is. And what does that mean for people like you who probably hold millions of dollars in supercars while, like you mentioned, the bubble just popped and you could have some debt on these cars? How do you feel towards this whole thing and how is this affecting your business personally? I've actually made some quite big adjustments, right? So I had a bunch of new allocations that were coming in. Like I got two Lamborghini Urus uh, three months ago. Mm -hmm. I didn't even rent them. I got them and sold them, right? So it's affecting my business because I'm my inventory is normally at 30 to 35 cars. Mm -hmm. Now that are plus 200,000, right? I mean, my company holds about 70 cars in total, but the ones that are really expensive, it's 35. Now I have 16. Mm. That's how it's affecting me. Cause I'm, I'm like running slim now, because I don't want to lose the money. Doesn't that also go hand in hand with demand? Aren't we seeing less demand right now? So couldn't that even out? Like, let's say you have 16 customers now, 16 cars works out before you had 30 customers, 30 cars. For through the rental business, uh, the demand isn't really shifted. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's less people in Vegas that are doing um, more uh, extra activities, right? So like we have, I have a helicopter that does a, you know, strip tours and that business has slowed down slightly because I mean, people are coming to Vegas. I don't think there's, there's probably some metric out there that says Vegas is the cheapest place in America to drink, right? It's like the cheapest alcohol, the cheapest food, you know, because the casinos subsidize it, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of like Venezuelan gas, you know, how it's like, quarter a gallon, right? Because they, they subsidize it. So mm -hmm. Vegas subsidizes her hotel rooms, they subsidize your food, they subsidize your alcohol to get you to gamble, right? So now we're seeing this huge influx of people that are not leaving the casino, they're just staying there to drink, party, and kind of like hang out at the pool, right? So the tourism numbers are, are really kind of changing and the, their values are going up, but the people who are coming in are not spending money, mm. right? So that's why you know, companies like um, the Venetian, I don't know, you're not really on the strip too often, no. but like the Win has like 30 Rolls Royce Phantoms and in front of my office is like their way to get to the airport. I used to see like 15 to 20 a day. Mm. I haven't seen one in a week. You know, those people are not coming to Vegas anymore. So the demand is is slowing down for, for like these wealthy, crazy people, right? But the people who don't have a lot of money are coming and they're spending money on credit cards. You know, they're renting the slingshots that I have. I see those everywhere, yeah. yeah. So like the demand shifted, yeah. right? So like the supercars, like you're saying, Jack, is it's it's different, right? But for the, like the auto cycle product, which is, you know, decent margins, it's mm -hmm. pretty good. It's increased. So like we just are like in the car market, the bubble shifting the demand. Right now you're going to see the demand go towards the, like the low income. For instance, you have a guy that shouldn't be driving a BMW is now going to probably lose his BMW because his payments 11, you know, the average car payments like $700. I saw that. Like just how is recently that crossed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just looking at my financial ability. Yeah. Right. And, and everybody around me, like my sister, right. She makes like $75,000 a year. Her car payment is $400 and she's like not having a hard time but she's not having like this up over abundance of savings to like live off of, mm -hmm. right? Imagine if her car payment was $700, like for a Mazda, you know, how could they survive, right? So all these people that have the above average car payments, I mean, if, if an average car is 700, what is a nice car? 12? Like Jack, can you have a $1,200 car payment? Uh, I mean, like, I, of course you can, but yeah, like, survive, would yeah. that make sense? 
Jack probably has thought about that. Let's <laughs> let's be real here. Jack has lo- looked at Teslas and been like, hey, it's not that bad. Fifteen hundred dollars yeah. a month. Well, could- Teslas were like seven hundred. Yeah. So. Tesla was. My mom yeah. has a Tesla lease, and it's seven hundred nineteen dollars a month mm-hmm. for a Model S, two thousand like twenty, right? The base one. That's what my mom drives. Mm-hmm. You know, but she contributes part of that car payment to her fuel, right? So like the excess fuel that she would spend. You know, maybe it's. $50 a week, that's $200 that she credits in her mind towards that car payment. So her old car payment may have been 600 and she'll get a Tesla with 800, she breaks even, she gets a more reliable car, yeah. you know, a, a better driving experience, you know, and, and something along those lines, right? But now a Tesla is 1500, the same car. I mean, it's, it would scare me to have a $700 a month car payment. But I would hate that. What about a $1,500 one? What about 2000 Jack? I would hate a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, I mean, those yeah. are real numbers now. Those are normal numbers. How are people qualifying for this, though? That's Because I know with problem. mortgages, it needs to be 33% of your income. So what's the metric for cars? Funny story. All right. I know a guy who uh, he makes $2 million a year on salary. He owns a he paid for a $700,000 house and um, he, he paid cash for it. He went to take out a, a mortgage on his property to cash out refi at 2.7 something percent back a couple months ago. It took him four months, okay? He's an orthopedic surgeon. Four months to do a cash out refi. He took 300 grand out, okay? The, the following month, he, he has a few Lamborghinis as well, all paid for. The bank offered him um, a refinance on his car. Mm-hmm. He got a $300,000 car loan on a car they did not even look at, they did not even inspect. They walked into the bank and in nine minutes, they took the title and gave him a $300,000 check. But couldn't they see that this guy has a ton of assets, he has plenty of income? refi? Four months for the same amount of money, right? That's why the auto loan industry is terrible because they don't do any due diligence. Yeah, They, they could literally write you the same exact, you could take an asset that's worth a million dollars, pull 300 grand on it, right, for a house and take you four months to go through the world of questions, but walk in and get a car loan and take out 100% of the value of the car for 300 grand at the same interest rate or just a slightly more in 10 minutes, right? So like, that's the problem with the auto loan industry is mm-hmm. they don't check, right? That's how it was in 07. They didn't check, you could just buy a house. Is hey, that because you- of regulation? That's because the that's how the banking system is designed currently. I think for auto loans, uh, yeah. when I was talking to Lucky, he said there's no oversight or there's no one, uh, you know, company or one industry or one, one uh, you know, entity to look over these loans to ensure that they're accurate. They don't sell. It's them. up to the banks yeah. to have that due diligence, but a lot of them just will stamp it off, sell it off. Yeah. Well, they're not selling them to government entities yeah. that's the problem right so like fannie mae freddie mac you know they're buying all these homes and they're buying all these mortgages they're putting them on the stock market and stuff i don't know if they don't do the same thing mm. when did you sell your excess 20 cars of your inventory over the past six months because and i saw the market coming down when you were selling them and also when you were holding cars all through the appreciation of the car market were you when you eventually did sell them were you selling them for a profit yeah. and then what about when you recently sold this last you know i have 20 with the exception of the most recent Aston Martin that I just told you about like last week, mm-hmm. every car I sold at a profit, right? That's wow. why I sold them because I knew that I couldn't make as much money. Like I could make more money in that one hour selling the car to someone who was willing to pay for it than I could renting the car six months, right? So that's the way I looked at it. I was like, well, Makes why sense. would I rent this for six months, take a gamble, you know, on on this? Uh, it's it's yeah. wild. But are there gonna be any cars that hold their value? Because of you course. still bought a car that was how much, $5 million? I have a couple of multi-million dollar cars. Um, I just bought a Pagani For a Huayra. personal, yeah. you, you have a Pagani? I was gonna drive it today, but. Oh, what did you drive today? I, I, it, I just drove a, okay, so funny story. <laughs> Tell me it's a uh, Volvo 2006? No, it's a 2022 <laughs> Ford Bronco. It's oh, a, okay, yeah, sure. I was yesterday. <laughs> Look, it's, uh, you have a. I can't. Believe, I, would, I, I, I wish you drove it, the Pagani just, today. Half the key in my Whoa! Yeah. What do you mean a half the key? Well, the other half's in the car because like it has a little thing. No. But, so I was gonna oh drive that today. Gosh, look at that! But uh, the oh yesterday, God. I I took off to go check on a restaurant of mine yeah. in Summerlin, and I had to take some stuff there. I had a light fixture, right? And so I needed to drop the light fixture off for the electrician to install it. So we have this like Ford Bronco that I I bought two of them for the rental fleet to like build them and make them all cool and crazy. Yeah. And uh, I left my office keys in the in the office mm-hmm. and then i didn't get back in time and my employees locked it so my office keys are in the office 
and our podcast happened to be before my office opened. And so I had the key to my car in my pocket so they couldn't move it out for me. Mm. So oh I took gosh. the Bronco. <laughs> Jeez, so, I would have loved to have seen that. Yeah. That's okay. I, I noticed that, first of all, how much is a Pagani? So this car is worth uh, just under like like around three three two three one. It, it's worth the, what like, you pay like for. Three hundred thousand? No, three million. Yeah. yeah three uh, oh, million. oh, yeah. Come we're on, talking Alex. like that yeah. Kind of, so okay, this okay. this car. If it, a Pagani was three hundred grand, I would have one. Yeah, <laughs> I'd have all of them. Uh, <laughs> the thing with the Paganis is that there's only a hundred made, right? So I have a coupe, the Gullwing doors. And uh, there has only been four sold within the last few years. So the value of a Pagani is kind of undetermined at this point, mm -hmm. right? There is one listed right now. It's a BC, which means it's like a race car version for 5 million. So mine's on a BC. Mine's actually car number 50 out of 100. I got a cool number. Mm. So um, I think that my car is worth like what I paid for it and what it's worth, I think I have like a million and a half equity. Okay. Hey, sorry, don't want to interrupt, but first we want to thank our sponsor, Wealthfront. Graham, you wouldn't believe it, man. I found a $2 bill on the street and I don't know what to do with it. Should I hang it up on a wall? Yeah, no, if you want to lose money to inflation, you could do that, or you could put it with our sponsor, Wealthfront. Wealthfront is a saving and investing app that can help you earn more on your money and start building wealth for your future. If you're keeping your cash anywhere that isn't earning you a high interest rate, you should really reconsider. That's because the Wealthfront cash account gives everyone a 1.4% percent APY interest rate, which is 20 times what traditional banks pay. And unlike other savings options, you'll always have access to your money since they have unlimited free transfers, no account fees, and free access to over 19,000 ATMs. Wealthfront only takes a few minutes to sign up and you can start earning your 1.4% APY immediately. And if you start now, you'll get a free $50 bonus with a $500 deposit. It's literally a free $50 bonus. You guys should definitely check it out. There are already nearly a half a million people using Wealthfront to save more, earn more, and build long-term wealth. So why wait? Earn 1.4% in your cash today by visiting Wealthfront.com slash ICH to get started. That's Wealthfront.com slash ICH. This no-brainer good news has been a paid endorsement from Wealthfront. So thank, thank you, you so, so much, much Wealthfront, Wealthfront and, and back, back to the, to the podcast. podcast. What about yeah. values for these cars? Are you worried about this car going down or like well, these no. high-end The reason, cars, so yeah. like my Koenigsegg, yeah. right? You know, those. that's like a four and a half million dollar car now. You have a Koenigsegg? Well, I know you have a Koenigsegg, but I didn't know it was four and a half million. Yeah. You have both of them at the same time? I have, yeah, I have, I have a lot of those cars right now. Yeah. Uh, I have Why? a Bayron. Because you're not rent, you're not renting them out. No. Why keep the money in those cars? Because it's better than houses. A, they're more liquid, right? And they, they have no value. There's no comps, mm -hmm. right? So like my Koenigsegg, for instance, is a Agera S. So I have the only road legal Agera in the United States. There's only one. So there's eight Agera RSs, which are like race cars that are very, I don't, I don't want to say the word like uncomfortable because mm -hmm. that's like a kind of a slap in the face for a Koenigsegg, but they're like very difficult to use. My friend, there's one here in town. My friend has an Agera RS and I drove it around the block compared to mine. And I'd probably almost pay more for mine because it's more usable than his. Right. And I think he feels the same way too. I'm mm -hmm. not exactly sure. I don't know. But like that car is almost unusable. And those cars are upwards of $10 million. So I have the only car that's road legal, right? And um, I feel like mine's worth like five, like half of that, because it's not as cool, like as like fancy, right? But it's still the same car, same yeah. engine. But you pay less for these. How are you able to pay less and come in with instant equity? Wouldn't the guy before you just say, I have the only one, gotta pay me? Well, I bought it a long time ago. Yeah. You know, before this, this transition into like, because think about like a few years ago, there wasn't that many cars that cost this much money. And now every new car, right? Like the new Koenigsegg, the Jesco, is like $4 million like base price, right? So that pulls the value of mine way up, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it, it, it's just the way that it works, right? Like the Ferrari, like the 458 Italia, right? They used to be 140,000. And now they're like 240,000 because the base price of Ferraris went up, right? So when the value of the car goes up, like, like your car was $140,000 new, right? And it's worth $400,000 today, right? Mm -hmm. So the new Ford GT being $1 million brings your car up. And so the cars that I have, the new ones are so much more expensive that it's more attractive to buy the older ones, right? And that's what happens, you know? So if the new Ford Broncos, 
right? Like the next year, the base price went up $20,000. It would bring the value of my previous year one up, you know, at least half. So that's what's happening with the car world today is Mercedes announced that they were going to drop all of their crappy cars, right? Like their A class, their B class. Are they really? Yeah. They decided to like just not make those anymore and raise the price because A, they don't want to sell to people who are faking it because they're complicated and they they complain a lot. They bring all their cars in for warranty work all the time because they can't afford it. And when they get the cars back on lease, the people that have those lower tier cars don't maintain them properly, mm. right? Because A, they, like I said, they can't afford it, right? And Mercedes service is the oh, same so price. so terribly expensive. Yeah, yeah, for E class, C class, whatever class you have, they're all the same, right? You know, the service, the spark plugs, they all use the same stuff. So people in the lower tier cars aren't maintaining them. They're trashing them. And so the dealers are getting these cars back that they have to put, you know, 10, 20% of the purchase price back into reconditioning and then try to resell them again and to another person to have the same revolving circle versus just selling one S class instead of like 11 C classes, you know, they make the same amount mm. of money, right? And so that's what's happening into the car world. Then the next, like Mercedes G wagons, they raise the base price by $40,000 for 2022. Let's talk about the chicken now. Yeah. Um, how did this idea come to light? How do you start this off? Well, I'm kind of like one of those guys that, that knows that the end is near you know, all the time. I mean, what comes, what goes up must come down. And, um, you know, I had such a great run with the car rental business. Uh, I started in 2015 and, uh, by 2020, I was like, kind of like, it was surreal. You know, we were just, it was just printing money. It was so good. Um, but then, I mean, in reality, it, it just, it's going to change. Right. And so I didn't want to be thinking about what I do next when the other one was over. So I sat down and, and, and actually it was, it was about the time that uh, the election was happening in late 2019. And I was like, wow, you know, the world is gonna change, the economy is gonna change, you know, we're gonna have a different party take over, everything is gonna shift, right? So let's prepare for that now. So my best friend, Edmund, he, he always like wanted to get me to invest in this other chicken company. Mm -hmm. And I went out there and I tried it and I was like, yeah, it's cool. I'm just, I'm not like a big proponent of doing things with other people, right? Cause then the control factor is kind of unique, right? So I said, I mean, let's just do it on our own, right? Everybody's got Nashville hot chicken, right? Why don't we make something else? Let's make like Texas hot chicken. We'll leverage my name, Houston. We'll call it Texas hot chicken, right? And and we'll create a sweeter version that's more mass marketable. Cause like Nashville hot chicken is very, it's very aggressive. It's it's designed to like hurt your mouth. It's mm -hmm. very spicy. Like even in the mild and mediums and stuff, like their flavor palette is very aggressive. So it's got a lot of Middle Eastern spices in there, like cumin and other different things that are not very well-rounded for America. And um, it was very popular in LA, but LA has a very diverse community of people. Right, so it worked really well. It's funny, Nashville hot chicken got very popular in Los Angeles. Yeah, I could see it. Yeah, and I mean, you lived in Los Angeles, but if you go <clears> to <throat> LA, there's like probably 300, 200, some crazy number of different businesses that sell Nashville hot chicken. So when Edmund and I sat down, we discussed it. Uh, we created this recipe that was a little bit better than Nashville because it was, like I said, more you know uh, even kill. And, and I think that that's the reason why we became so popular so fast is because we we made a product that was like sweet. You know, it's it's spicy. You can get really spicy ones. I mean, you guys have all had it here on the podcast. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can Regrettably, hurt Regrettably, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's not designed to be <laughs> edible. It's designed to be like almost like a gimmick, right? You know, yeah. anybody that eats Houston's, we have a problem is just, I've never even, I, I couldn't even touch it, right? I've only had a mild. I've never even had a medium sandwich at my restaurant. Really? Yeah. You should. I just. We should have brought one and just had you eat it. Yeah, well, I just have like this ulcer and like maybe I'll just like puke blood and Hence the IV business. I'm just trying to get healthy. You know yeah, what I mean? Sure. I'm like super yeah. fat now, you know? So started this chicken business. I was like 170 pounds in 2019. Yeah. Now I'm 203. Okay. Like that's a lot of weight, right? But it tells you how good my food is. Right. So I keep eating it, right? Which yeah. is wonderful. But uh, yeah, I, I gotta go. I, got, I told all my employees, don't serve me anything but a salad no matter what I order. Yeah. Okay. Just if I order a, a really crazy sandwich, bring me a salad. Yeah, you Houston know. has a great setup too. I went to his house the other day, or I guess it was a few weeks ago. He's a private chef. Yeah, cooking like making pokey, like fresh what a fresh pokey bowl. Yeah, I walked in. He's like, "Do you want pokey?" I'm like, "What?" He's <laughs> like, "No, they're it? making it right now." Like Did literally, a chef. yes, and was it was it amazing. How much does a private chef cost? Uh, less than it costs to go out to eat every night. 
So for a family of four, there, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> I spend, I give him five grand a month. Um, covers all my stuff. Guys, let's just uh, let's just split it. Let's just go three ways. So let's go. Five. I bet we could if we months. all win in the same amount between four people. That would be, you know, with Macy, twelve hundred, twelve hundred and fifty a count month. Kelsey and two. Yeah, that would be about a thousand a month. It's, it's $30 really, a not, day for that's not all bad. five of that's us. That's not bad because nobody uh, in my household likes cooking. So Yeah. Well, what's good about the, the chef is that they, um, so he makes, I don't eat, uh, I don't eat anything that comes out of a microwave. I never have. I, I figured like that's where cancer was invented, you know, cancer in the microwave came out at the same time. So hmm. I've, I've always thought that in my life. Hmm. It's probably wrong, but it doesn't matter. So anyways, um, I don't reheat any food. So he, I eat my lunch uh, out um with my my team and my office or whatever but when he comes over and cooks he actually makes enough food for my kids and my wife for the next day so like they get their lunches and uh if they want breakfast like he puts a whole menu together for them mm. so my kids are homeschooled so they their teacher comes over and she reheats the food in like the stove and everything it has the whole kitchen for her yeah and so that five thousand doesn't just include dinners it's pretty much all the meals that we eat as a family so yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty dope. Yeah. Side uh, tangent here. Is there a reason you chose homeschooling versus like a public school or a private school? Uh, yeah. Why? Because they're like not safe. So it's a safety thing. Yeah. I mean, also like mentally and yeah. physically, both are not safe. You know, you can't control like your kids are taught what the teachers know. Right. So like if I wanted my kids to be taught by somebody, I would want them to be taught by someone who I look up to or I trust that is giving them the right kind of knowledge. I mean, I think that the next generation, like my kids are three and six, mm -hmm. and there's just no reason that like the, the teachers that are in, I, I'm trying to be not rude right now. So I gotta, I'm just going <laughs> to think yeah, okay, this okay. through, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, the Take teachers time. that are currently teaching, their skill set and their knowledge is based on the past. And our, our world is changing so fast, they don't have time to adapt, right? So like, let's just say, for instance, on YouTube, right? Right now, if you want to get into a business, Right, you're gonna learn from people like Ryan, you, Alex Ramazzi, these these like business influencers who've had a very long track record of being successful. Right. So if I want my kids to learn something, you know, now basic skills like reading and writing is simple stuff. Okay. I'm not concerned about that. But like the the basic rules and principles and morals that they're gonna live by, I want them to learn that from someone who I look up to or I trust. Right. And so I hired a very specific teacher to teach them those things, you know, and plus school kind of gears kids towards working nine to five. Right. I mean, you go to school from X amount of time to X amount of time and you have homework and like there's just so much structure there. And in the future, 20 years from now, when they're going to be on their own, I don't think that that structure is going to exist anymore. Now, what about the social aspect of them getting to hang out with other kids and, you know, trying to figure out where they fit in and, and networking and all those those skills that are kind of learned at a younger age. Everybody says that. Yeah. And then I ask them like, like when have you ever seen kids playing anymore? They're all on their phones. None of them go out after school. Like when we were kids, we used to go on the front of the house and just skateboard and hang out and ride bikes. Yeah. You can go into any neighborhood and you'll never see that now, right? There is no social aspect of school. It's actually antisocial. Like all the kids are getting bullied online while they're at school. You know, and it's like this whole new like front, you know, and, and that's like the worst part about school is being around other kids, you know, because everybody has their own demons now. And now that there's so much information, like even there's there's an actual number. There's a real statistic for suicide among girls under 14. Like if you would have asked me that, if that was even possible, I would yeah. have said no way. But now there's a real number for that because of like of peer pressure and of, of all this like crazy science stuff that they're they're going through you know in the in their hormones and all this stuff and during that age right i don't want them around those types of people because the other parents may be neglecting their children at that time and those kids are taking it out on my you know children you know like i don't know if my kids are are hanging out with the right people yeah. when they're at school i don't know what they're doing you know what about when they're like 20 and they're going off on their own do you think that maybe they might not be as prepared as someone else who's had those experiences i don't i don't know because yeah. we don't know what the future holds but like my kids go to gymnastics right i mean i have uh four or five employees that all have kids that are about the same age mm -hmm. and every week you know they do a play date like you see my house i have a playground yeah. it's a kid's environment there right so they have their friends over two three days a week they play 
there's a couple of cousins that we have, you mm -hmm. know, that are all the same age. So they're getting a lot of time with other kids, but just not a massive amount of kids, right? They're getting a lot of time with specific kids that I think are all being raised in the right, the right setting. Sure. You know, so okay. I don't know. I'm really specific with that stuff. Like, yeah, I feel like the 15 years that I was in school or whatever that is, 14 years was the worst part of my life. And all the bad decisions came from people that I knew, whether I was trying to be cool like them or I was trying to lead them or whatever it was, all those choices were all from that environment, right? And when I started to be on my own, when I, when I turned 18 and I moved out and I did all this stuff, my life started to just go straight up. Mm -hmm. And I was very focused and I was independent and I, choose, I chose my own friends, right? And I had two or three, not 30, right? So it yeah. was a really different, I don't know. I'm just like, maybe I'm really weird, you know? It's a tough conversation. Yeah. It's to have. easy for me to say without kids. Side tangent back to <laughs> back to chicken now. Um, I know actually, you got it. You got to say yeah. it, Graham. I mean, this is we been long okay. Overdue. We got a exciting new opportunity here. Uh, I'm actually really looking forward to this. So, you held a car meet at a grand opening of a restaurant, which I do for, all the time. All yeah, of them at uh, Houston Saw Chicken, and I show up there, and we go in, and the food was so unbelievably good. And the staff was so incredibly friendly. And then you came up and thanked us all for coming. And, and I think I jokingly said, like, oh, I want to see the back. Or like, because you guys were so busy back there. Yeah. And you gave me and Macy the tour of the back. And it was like this. It looked like a, you know, the uh, the really high-end lab from Breaking Bad at the very end. <laughs> nice. So like, it kind of looked like that with Great. like all the, the stuff. No, but seriously. Like, I that's sort of, no wonder like that it, chicken is so addicted. But, but, it, yeah, but it looked, it reminded me of just like, this is how pristine everything was. And like how nice they kept it. And uh, I jokingly said, like, oh, man, I want one of these. Or, like, I, and you said yes. And so for the last few weeks, we've been working on some of the some of the contract details. But I think we're pretty close on signing to get, can I say the location? Sure. Sahara and Jones here in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be the building. And so, uh, and it has a drive through which I'm really excited to. Are you Bad using news. the drive through We're not using the drive through anymore. Because I've changed, I've, I've. Oh, I was I was looking forward to the drive through. All right, I'm the just learning about this. Yeah, is such a bad idea, and I've been saying this for a long time, because no one sees the end result of the drive through. Okay, with the drive through, you cannot serve alcohol, right? With the drive through, you have to have six extra staff members, and with the drive through, people drive around the building and don't get the full experience, right? So they're not seeing the inside that you saw. They're not feeling the inside, right? Mm. And they actually order less per ticket than if they go inside. And so the drive through increases your revenue, but decreases your profit. And so I had this argument with my business partner, Edmund, and, and we agreed to try it. And so I finally got it through everybody's head that the drive through is a bad idea because alcohol pairs so well with our food and it's got the biggest profit margin on anything we sell in the restaurant. Mm. So if you want to make money and you want to differentiate differentiate yourself from Chick Fil A, the the my biggest pet peeve is someone comparing my restaurant to Chick Fil A. Right? We're not even close. I mean, that's like literally comparing your Volvo to my Pagani, okay? <laughs> which like, I tried to do. But. Yeah, it's, like, oh, it's offensive. You know, I don't get offended <laughs> easily. Yeah. But we both have leather, leather seats, which is kind of cool. <laughs> but we both have windows and exactly. windshield. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's. The drive-through is such a bad idea because we're not building a brand to be considered cheap, right? We're building a luxury chicken brand, right? That's what we want to be. That's what you want to be mm -hmm. because in the luxury space, right? The sky's the limit. You know, you're bringing in someone that's like ready to spend thirty to forty dollars for their meal, get a drink, a beer, a twenty-ounce draft beer, right? We have draft beer, uh, craft regular Modelo. You know, we have our own beer now at HHC called Afterburner, mm -hmm. and um, it's it's like designed to be that place where you want to hang out, you know, like the above it, 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 it like, I think we're going to replace the restaurants like Applebee's. Okay. Right. Applebee's Outback Chili's, those restaurants to me are dying, right? Margins are too low. They're, the, the buildings are too big. And these fine, casual Chipotle esque restaurants are going to replace those big box waiter, you know, uh, sit down tables mm. because that experience is not, they're not able to compete, right? When I can serve a chicken sandwich that is miles ahead of that food, right? I mean, Chipotle, sorry, not Chipotle, uh, Chili's and Applebee's are serving frozen food. Everything's frozen. Nothing's fresh, 
right? And they have huge staff numbers that cost a lot of money. And so like that genre is gonna get replaced and I wanna be the one that replaces them. And so that type of food isn't fast food, right? But it isn't like Fleming's or high-end food like catch or something that you go into ret like a yeah. full crazy, you know, $100 meal for, right? And so when we put alcohol there, we make way more money. How do you have your employees so friendly and happy all the time? Because I pay them well. Can and you I, share some of those numbers or sure. like how I mean, you look basically there's 25 the average restaurant is 25 people, right? Everybody gets a tip share. So the average restaurant brings in twenty two to twenty eight thousand dollars a month in tips. So between twenty five people, they all split that. Mm -hmm. So everybody's getting like a thousand dollar bonus at the end of the month. And um, we're hiring based on experience. So, you know, people make thirteen dollars an hour, people make fifteen dollars an hour. No one makes minimum wage. I mean, our lowest paid employee is thirteen, which is five dollars above minimum wage here in Vegas. Um, but it's the culture. Right, like when you walk into royalty, and you really haven't been to royalty too often, but when mm. you walk in there, like it's the vibe. People love that. That's why I'm so picky about people going inside the restaurant, because that's what you're missing. No one expects that kind of environment when they walk in. Like you're asking me about people that are friendly from four months ago that you remember. Yeah, you remember the people that served you four months ago. That should be like right there to tell you that. The experience of going in is worth every every minute that it takes for you to get out of your car and go order inside, right? You know, that's the goal for the restaurant is for people to feel like to always exceed expectations, right? And so that's our company culture. You know, I mean, there's all these business guys that ask you what your values and your principles are. And Houston's Hot Chicken is the principle is to exceed your expectations, but it's the culture around the employees and it's that experience that that customers get when they walk in. But how do you pick that? And how do you ensure that they that they keep up to that standard? The easiest way to continue your culture is to make sure your leadership has that culture, right? Because people follow the leader, okay? Like if the leader has a bad attitude and he's over there yelling at everybody, your culture just dies immediately, right? But if you have this guy that's always so happy, it's contagious. Right. And if you see the manager of the restaurant going out and cleaning the tables and taking care of the customers and, you know, remembering people's names, right? We have people that eat at Houston's Hot Chicken three times a week. You've got to remember their order. You've got to remember their names. You gotta you gotta really treat them like they're special, right? And so if you if you have that from the top, it just tri just trickles all the way down. Another thing that uh, you were mentioning, you wanted to talk to Alex Hormozy. <laughs> yeah. I just What's up with this? I, I've been, I watched actually Alex, uh, for about a, I don't know, maybe a year now. And, um, I just, I think that Alex and I have a lot of things in common and I think Alex and I have a lot of things that we don't agree on. And I've, uh, I know Alex lives in Vegas mm -hmm. and I think it'd be cool to do, honestly, I just, I feel like your podcast needs drama, you know? I mean, your best <laughs> video oh, no. like was Jack and his dating life. Right. People love that, Jack. Yeah. Come on. For the algorithm, we want to bring back another Tinder date. And Jack's like, no, I don't want you. But you got to think of the algorithm. I, it's I the algorithm, Jack. I do not Jack. like it, man. I really don't do you like it. you don't doing like it? What if anything you... dating life, anything <laughs> like that, like airing it all out online, I've just not been a fan. <laughs> well, we get the highest so engagement. We get That's the highest why it's engagement. It's so popular because everybody yeah. wants to know the drama. Yeah, but the thing is, there's external like things that occur outside of whatever happens in the podcast. It's all you know, for the it's views, embarrassing. Dude. Yeah, it's but, then, the but then I leave the podcast room and I go back home and then I get a few DMs or whatever. <laughs> I get a few texts from my family that's watching it and it's like, oh my what God. What do they say? <laughs> Give us some examples. It's just weird, man. My grandma watches every episode. Oh, <laughs> so? I don't know. What's and, wrong with that? Your grandma. And let's say, let's say there's like a, a girl I went on one date with, right? And then I talk about an experience that I had with some other girl that I went on a date with. Then it's like, well, what is this one girl that I went on a date with? think now that she's, she's seen me talk about a date that I had with this well, other she's girl. she's jealous. Well, that's Check not a good thing. In the past. No. I, I don't get it. If, if you went on a date a year ago. I'm not talking about dates a yeah. year ago, man. You but know eventually it'll be, let's say. Yeah, eventually say, it'll be a year ago. So we'll just start talking about dates that are a so year ago. So basically like, if we just saying, Jack, you have to postpone your love life for one year. <laughs> basically. But what's the downside if we have one Tinder date on now? I just think. What happens? First of all. I think people are going to get sick of it. No. Second of all, I don't think so. <laughs> second of all, they're just weird, like stuff that happens. Like I said, outside of the podcast, the thing is we finished wrapping up the episode. You go home and you go, you know, kiss Macy or whatever you guys do in <laughs> secret. Okay. <laughs> Alex does the same with his wife or his fiance wife, Kelsey. Right. And then I fiance go wife. and then I have like all of these random awkward situations that happen outside of this I mean, because I tied like myself. Just to maybe yeah. they would want to be like, I feel like some girls are such attention 
grabbers that they would want to go on dates with you just so they can end up on the podcast. <laughs> that sounds terrible. You know? I don't want that. Like, I mean, Jack, here's the thing. Insane man would I think what Jack's worried about is that we're going to film an episode and sometimes we post like a, a month later. Sure. So maybe in that month, he starts seeing someone new. That's not what I'm worried about at all. But what's the problem? I don't know. What I'm worried it sounds about, like dude, a great okay, idea. So, so <laughs> when, when we did that thing where I went on a date with those four girls, right? Let's say that there were, a, let's say two, three girls I was casually talking to, right? Maybe we hadn't even gone on a date yet, right? But I met them on some Tinder thing or whatever. Or maybe I'd gone on one date with them. We just went out and got lunch or dinner or whatever, right? And then they see this video where I blind date four girls on the Steph family, Graham, Steph, and after, sorry, Graham, Steph, and after hours. I do that, right? Um, then what, right? They, they no, see I don't see that. Go, you're casually dating. Four dating. Four it's not, like not the, and if they think you're they're your girlfriend yeah. after I know, going but out for dinner once, the, like, <laughs> although we are casually dating, I think it's best casually to just dating keep that the, stuff that they haven't even met. Like you were saying, like maybe just talking to online on Tinder, and if they see the video, but you haven't even met okay, them well, yet. Okay, well, I think we have to define dating. Dating is literally just going on a date with someone. Yeah, you have no obligation to that person exactly. whatsoever. But the thing is, that's not necessarily stuff that you want them to be privy of. You don't want to air all that stuff out. But how do they even know to look for it? They know who I am. Oh, they do. Oh, yes, I know. oh, oh so, so uh, but you don't want them to be on the podcast. Well, I'm, I'm, I'd say it's pretty hard at this point not to def define me at least somewhat by my work, right? It's like if I talk to someone, this is going to come up inevitably. So they're going to look it up. They're going to just see try it one more time. I don't see the issue, Jack. Yeah, because you know, you're honestly, already Graham, you have a fiance Jack, already. It doesn't just, work. just go like this for a second. Dude, dude me? Just, just yes, go like this you. for a second. Yeah, you should just bring a blind date on the podcast and not tell them. I've been thinking that you should you yeah. should really do that. Okay. That'd be so funny. Be like, hey, who's our podcast guest? It's your new blind date. All right, you know. <laughs> All right, Jack, you're good. Oh. Cool. That wasn't even that bad. All right. I just didn't you know, okay. ruin the surprise. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know. I agree. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so back to yeah, Alex. Okay. Uh, you know, he's so he's so uh, he's very just like me, very specific in his his views. Right. And I think that that'd be a cool conversation to have. I don't know. I just think that there should be some drama on this podcast, you know, besides uh, Jack's love life. Right. You should just get a couple of guys on here that just don't have the same opinions on some stuff and just have them debate it out. You know, I like, love that. I, would yeah, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I was on Ryan's podcast and uh, we were talking about the real estate market a little mm -hmm. bit. And like, I don't see how it's sustainable that someone bought a house in 2020 for 700 grand and posted it in 2022 for sale for 2.7 million. You know, and uh, he said, there's not, there's no crash coming. And I'm like, well, I don't really see how that's sustainable. So, you know, we had like a little uh, mild argument about that sure. and he gave his opinion and everything. And, and I even actually went back and watched it myself. You know, I was interested to like hear his side of the story without me having to think of my rebuttal in that side of the story, you know? Yeah. So um, I think the debates between these big entrepreneurs, I mean, there's so many people online now that tell you how to get rich and how to be successful and a very small amount of them have an actual track record of running businesses outside of the business of telling people how to get rich right you know so like i think instagram and all these places is oversaturated with with the uh, gurus mm -hmm. right that have never done anything with their life other than be a guru you know and so i think alex is the first guy that's like had a long track record of business and he's doing it for the right reasons you know he's putting out all that content that is uh very very important i mean his wife is incredibly intelligent mm -hmm. which is super cool you know and so i don't know i just think that'd be a good a good thing i mean what do you think i really want to do that i love the idea yeah. i think we should definitely host a debate yeah yeah that'll be the first ever ice coffee hour debate but yeah I, think we... I just think that'd be a really cool yeah like update or upgrade to the iced coffee hour. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, mean, I agree. How with many completely. people, how many more people do you plan? I mean, how many more people can you put on here? I mean, you've literally interviewed everybody. No, Kevin oh, O'Leary, no. Mark Cuban. I mean, those are the, I the feel like we've, 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 we've hit maybe 10% yeah. of the well, potential what of what we Mr. could Beast. do. Yeah. Yeah. But you guys are like, you're hitting a lot of the YouTube guys, mm -hmm. right? So if you want to branch out into the real business world and, yes. and get like Gary Vernachuk and you know, the big, big guys, right. I think those would do excellent, yeah. you know, um, but that's a, that's a different level, right? That's like a different stage of the podcast. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when you don't do the YouTube guys anymore, you know, cause those are the, that's the bottom tier, right? And though they're the next tier, but as far as like YouTube guys, I mean, I've watched almost every podcast, you know, and um, I guess I'm just trying to, I, I'm trying to figure out who I'm missing, you know, but there's a lot of people that are new and upcoming, Yeah, you know? Um, I think you should actually interview some like local, like celebrity type people too, maybe like, um, we really want to do Dan Bolzerian. Yeah. <laughs> he would never come on here. No. He's I, terrible. I, I, Dan's here. I mean, he's yeah. just, maybe, I mean, 
Dan's about to be on Dancing with the Stars kind of lifestyle, you know? Like, I feel like he's a fall from grace at this point. You know what I mean? He's like really falling off. But mm. that's just basically because he doesn't care, you know? Just watch you watch as the pod be like, I'll debate Houston. Oh, yeah. yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> I actually lived in Dan Bilzerian's ex house. So oh, his, yeah. he lived in uh, this house and I moved into it. And it, it had all like the guy that had bought it, I rented it for like eight months because I was in, mm. in transition. And um, I don't know, it just felt weird. Did you see anything in that house that like screamed Dan? It yeah. was all the same stuff. He left it furnished. It was his, I had to replace the beds, right? For the eight months I lived there, I bought new beds. But all of his furniture is still there. All of his stuff is still there. Oh, Every wow. single thing Was is still like there. Was it like fancy stuff? Yeah, yeah. Kind Dan's got expensive. excessive yeah. taste. And He's amazing taste. No, I mean, I was renting it. So it was the owner's. Yeah. Uh, the owner probably just took the furniture or made like a buyout. I don't know. I think like shin Lim, the magician oh, yeah, totally cool. he's yeah. cool yeah. you know like he he'd be a great person because he's I, like i agree just a, a cool come up story yeah i mean there's a lot of guys like that in vegas that have like a cool kind of story i mean andre um he's he's kind of like that right i mean mm -hmm. like las vegas local is like yeah. a, some fame and everything yeah and he did some cool stuff i don't know yeah we've had andre on what three times yeah. twice yeah. twice Andre's cool. I like yeah. Andre. Yeah. I met Andre like I think five or six years ago. No way. When we first started. Yeah. Wow. We had a mutual friend. It was like his roommate at the time. Okay. Um, he was one of my employees and Andre had moved in with him. They started living together and um, he'd come around and show me all his card tricks. And I was like, I just cannot believe how skilled someone can be at something so specific like mm. playing cards. Yeah. Like I went and saw Shen Lim um, with my kids. And I mean, I, I just, it's like you're watching a movie. Yeah. It's crazy. Like it's, I couldn't believe Andre was not. doing some tricks for Jack and I the other week. It was crazy. And he uh, did the same tricks like six yeah. times in so, a row. Couldn't figure yeah, it out. Yeah, so he'd do a trick where basically uh, he'd fan out cards and have us pick a card. And we would look at it and we'd put it back in the deck. He'd shuffle the deck and then he would pull that card out, out of, his pocket? of his pocket. And we're like, how did you do that? He's like, I'll do it again for you. <laughs> and he did it multiple times. And I'm sitting there looking at his pocket the entire time. And he does the same trick. And he keeps pulling it out. I'm like, he, he's not even close he to his it, pocket. Didn't he pull it out of his mouth one time oh, too? Oh, no, yeah. No, he was like doing all this stuff with his hand. And then he's all, and he just points up. And then we look up. It's and there's a card in his mouth. And yeah. it's the card that we picked. Yeah. And well, yeah. But he was calling that misdirection because we were so focused on the pocket now that he put it in his mouth. And then we were focused on his mouth and the pocket. And he pulled it out of like somewhere else. It was I'm, insane. I'm convinced that people that do that stuff can stop time. It's got to be something. They have to be. There has to be something. Time, yeah. And they take the card, they look at it, they put it back in your hand, and they put the card in their pocket, and then they renew time. Like it's got to be something like that. It doesn't make any sense. No. Like it, there's a there's an insane. This guy Shin Lim. You should see this guy. Yeah. I mean, he's like, <laughs> he had us go in the audience. Have you seen the show? No. He had a, he had a trick where the audience all had cards, and basically you have to like rip them up in different ways, and then you throw them away, like whatever ones you you have. And then every single person in the audience got the same card, like put back together. It, yeah, I, I saw the show. Like that's an absolutely incredible show. It had it like five hundred people in the audience, and they all got the same damn card. <laughs> it's like crazy. Wow. My kids, three years old, six years old, did the same thing, and they got the same card. Like I was just, I just couldn't believe it. You know, I, it just it blew my mind. I want to know how they're done. That's what I'm so curious about. <sighs> I just how do you do it there isn't there like a show that does magic exposed like there's a youtube channel that shows you all of the things that have like magic exposed i think I, yeah but a lot of these are custom tricks that, sure. that they work on individually i think and that's so why they, uh, yeah like david yeah, no. copperfield is so wealthy you know i heard david copperfield's like a billionaire and he's mm. the one that designs all the tricks and he like sells them to other people or I'm something sure. i mean think about that that's like it's got to be an insane business mm -hmm. yeah you know so niche it's I so think niche. with the show that you guys are talking about, they can show like all the the gimmicks, like all the like all the stuff that doesn't take like much skill. Uh, but nobody wants to watch a TV show where you're talking about sleight of hand for like thirty minutes. Like this is how you do this, you yeah. know, by misdirecting here. So it's like it doesn't really reveal some of those tricks that you guys. Yeah, it's like the cut like. in half or like the disappearance. Yeah, and, those big yeah, ones. Right. Yeah, the sleight of hand stuff probably not that easy. So yeah, but that'd be a good that'd be a good person to put on here. I would love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's he's our age. You yeah, know? he's in his thirties. Yeah, right. So that'd be cool. Yeah. I don't know. Who else are you thinking? Uh oh gosh, uh we've had a list. If we want to get some some TikTok people, yeah, we feel like that's the next step. Um, uh, because we've covered a lot of YouTube, we want to get I actually to learned a new audience on TikTok. Daniel Mac 
like I was pretty surprised how Instagram and like how Snapchat pays the most. Yeah, I would. I had no, no idea. idea. So we're starting on Snapchat now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, me too. Like literally, like I, I, I watched that video and I text my my film guy and I was yeah. like, start a Snapchat right now. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Mm. Uh, I hope maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe it's not going to pay as well because there's so many people going to go yeah. on it now. The thing is, it's we're going down. we're using um, uh, what what do you want to call it? companies or like we're using agencies, um, agencies who do this for us mm -hmm. because there's a strategy to Snapchat and Facebook um, and even TikTok that it's hard to replicate. Like I know YouTube really well, sure. but what I'm doing in YouTube would not be applicable for Facebook. And it's like it, relearning a new algorithm. Facebook is, is but, a machine too. I, it blows my mind. I have a video that I put on um, YouTube. It only got like 500 some thousand views. Uh, got like 3 million views on Facebook in two weeks. Wow. And I'm just like, what is this place? Like how, I don't understand. Maybe I should stop making YouTube videos. Like, yeah. I, and going back and forth, trying to figure it out. Like who, I have a different editor for Facebook. So all of my YouTube videos have different cuts than, you know, Facebook. So we recut them all. So they're like, maybe the same person watches it. I don't know. Just like an extended cut kind of thing. And Facebook always makes like three to one more money than mm -hmm. YouTube. Maybe even more actually. Wow. Do you guys post these on Facebook? Uh, not yet, but we're planning to. Yeah. Well, the thing is, what's great about it is Facebook's an older audience. Yep. Right. Instagram and, and all the other ones are very young. And so like YouTube is kind of a younger audience as well. I mean, YouTube is a very broad audience realistically, but like 20 year olds aren't on Facebook. It's all like the 30, yeah. 40, 50 year olds. Well, yeah. The downside I will say of Facebook is that it's a big international audience. Yeah. And so that means when you're targeting with ads, the ads generally pay lower, but there's a bigger audience to reach to. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, definitely running in play ads, you know, not like just the Facebook generated ads, yeah. the ones that are, you know, we're getting sponsored money and stuff for the, those don't have the same, um, outreach, obviously, unless you're selling a product that can be shipped somewhere. I mean, all the ads that you do are pretty much can all you, us based. Yeah. But can you like sign up with uh, the stock things overseas or no, 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 even Canada right now. It's just us based. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, some of those things are pretty sweet. Yeah, all that stuff that they come up with. So guys, if you guys don't know, we actually have a Patreon. If you guys wanna sign down below, um, there's different tiers, some of the perks. You get to ask our guests some questions or submit you know, a chance for to ask them some questions. In our highest tier, um, we're actually throwing some private events about two times a year. So if you guys wanna come hang out with us, check out the Patreon. And while you're um, on the Patreon, just go back to YouTube, go to the description, and then follow me on Instagram. Oh, My link is down below and so yeah, yeah you know so now we're gonna ask some patreon questions from some of our members no patreon questions oh really now we're not did gonna you, ask some patreon post? questions post? from some of our members yeah, it was late it was last night at 8 p.m i'm not popular. you didn't ask earlier what you didn't ask earlier no <laughs> jack andrew you better leave this in <laughs> do you want to do it Oh my god. Always. All right. No, no, no. Here's the fight, drama. Here's fight. the drama. I have no fight. login to Patreon. I have no idea. <laughs> I will gladly give you the login. I can't do it. That's the thing. It's like he'll, But you he'll, can't either? I can't. Yeah, but but you have all is, the employees, but, but the, Jack. What? You have all the employees. We have the same amount. And I don't have employees. <laughs> I have contractors. 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 So, <laughs> I like that. So first of all, Graham likes to take on new things, right? Which is great. Amazing. Entrepreneurial mindset, right? That's what you do. But the thing is, as soon as he takes on any new thing, especially with regard to the iced coffee hour, it basically defaults that the responsibility is put on me. So he came up with the idea of creating a Patreon. And I said, I love the idea of the Patreon, but I already told him. I remember that one of the first things that I said, as soon as we start the Patreon, I know that the responsibility is going to be put on me. And I think that this is something that we should discuss, right? And Graham's like, oh, no, it'll be fine. I'll be fine. And of course, the Patreon happens. Graham has not logged into the Patreon once. He hasn't gone back to anybody the on the Patreon that, at yeah. all. I get back to every single message that we've gotten on the Patreon. I'm posting every single podcast early on the Patreon. I'm asking questions for them to ask to our guests on the, every Patreon thing. And then one time I post it late at 8.30 p.m. <laughs> the night before, right? And this is yeah. 12, they have tw they had 12 hours to ask questions to you. And sure, maybe I could have posted it earlier, but Graham didn't even think about it once. Didn't think about no. texting the me. Thing hey, is, you should when, add, uh, 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 <sighs> He didn't think about texting me. Hey, Jack, post on the Patreon. He doesn't remind me for any of this stuff. Basically, the responsibility automatically gets shifted over to me, and Graham sits on the side. Okay. Our agreement. Guys, I'll gladly our, take care yeah. of this for a fee. No, so. our agreement, Jack, Jack was going to handle everything in the back end, including editing. It was sponsors, scripting, everything back end Jack was going to handle. I was going to handle the title thumbnail, being physically here, and coordinating guests. And so 
to me, everything else in the back end is the responsibility of Jack. Right, but the back end has been handled by me. And and then we add on the Patreon, which was a thing that, that we was, it was outside of the scope. Too, but it was outside of the scope that of the stuff that we but, initially agreed but, upon. But the, the thing is, Patreon, how much how much money have you earned from the Patreon? Can, I, I'm fine. Yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's like I mean, we we started it like three weeks yeah. ago, and we have like fifteen to sixteen hundred dollars. Yeah. Did yeah. you get a cut? Of but that? yes, that's yes. your responsibility. Why? Because you're it, the back end. But this was outside of the scope of outside the initial of the scope, agreement. But it's also outside of the scope of the income too. That so is true, Jack. Is additional. Yeah. So I know, like, but we never... It. Okay, so if, if you're seeing this as one independent prod, project, we never talked about the terms and the workload of this independent project. It just defaulted to my thing. I just I feel like because you're getting paid for it, right, that it's an additional income and it's an additional work, right? If it was free and you guys had a Patreon and it was another thing that wasn't an income, right, then I would agree that maybe Graham should, should take a role because he's doing the a very small amount, right, and you're doing a very large amount. But because there's an income added to it, right, that is using the likeness of the iced coffee hour and everything like that, it falls in line with the back end. I Only because there's an income. That's my opinion. I think Houston worded that perfectly. Couldn't I, have I said it better I, myself. My I think, opinion. Yeah. I think that's a that is a very strong argument. <laughs> but at the same time, like I said, we agreed on some set like some set responsibilities. Okay. This is yeah, but those responsibilities were designed on the income ability of this iced coffee hour. It weren't they weren't designed on the new additional income from the future projects that the iced coffee hour brings. So like that, that's also an assumption. Well, it's an assumption that it's going to make money, yes. But if in three weeks you've made sixteen hundred dollars and you've split that appropriately, right? Then the the same rules apply, you know, because it's an auxiliary option to the iced coffee hour. But then you have to think about this, like, to the nth degree, right? Imagine Graham starts adding on all these other responsibilities, Correct. all these other verticals that somehow but, correlate back to the iced coffee hour, right? I mean, still, but it your income would scale in proportion to that. Yeah, I know, so, but, but at the what same you would point, do with that, let's say there was like an, an enormous amount of responsibilities that the two of you agreed that you would need a third person, right? And that would cover a salary, and then that would come off the top of all of the items combined, right? So let's say the iced coffee hour made ten thousand dollars a month, right? And you need to pay someone a thousand to help you out with all these things, and so, so limit some of your responsibilities, limit some of your responsibilities, and you both agreed to take it off the top, and then you would split after. That would make sense. So there's going to become a time where. Patreon turns into like 10 other things, right? Right now, if it's at the maximum capability of your workload, then I think that you you agree, you stay with this. And then this is what you tell Graham, like, hey, look, this is this is it. I can't add any more responsibilities than these particular items. So if we add one more thing, we need to bring on someone else. So I think with regards to the Patreon and anything else that we add onto the podcast, realistically, something Graham and I have been talking about for a while now is that we need a producer of the podcast. Agreed. Basically, that handles all this stuff. So we let the host be the host, and then we let someone else basically be managing the back end and having it flushed. The thing is, I'm good at it, right? Sure. I'm fine at it. I've been doing it for a very long time, but I know that out there, there is someone that's better. And there's someone that's going to be more diligent, more structured. Yeah, that's the at thing. what cost, right? I mean, how could, what would you pay your producer? So we've talked yet. Yeah, so we've talked about, about this. The salary, but what I, do you think the salary would be? Should we go on record to say it? I mean, just an idea. I, just I'm on record. Salary, I'm, in, I'm on record as telling Jack, I don't think we need a producer. Maybe not yet, but I mean, let's just say you did hire a producer. Would you pay them five thousand dollars a month? I mean, at what? How much are you willing to to pay them for for that? Service? I don't think it. Yeah, I don't think that's it a lot makes of money. Any, I don't think it makes any sense to have a producer. But you did. You told me li literally like a month and a half ago that you wanted it. No, that was from one of your existing contractors who could take on some additional work to help us out. Yeah, to step into but the position but, of producer. And then you were also- But there's, but but there's no, but there's no Graham, like dedicated also, producer. No, you also mentioned someone that has never worked in the business whatsoever before. And they just, at this time, did not have a job. And you're like, oh, we could move them into the position of producer. We could try them out for a few months. You said that to me at the gym. I remember it was a month because, and a half ago. They, because they were not working Because they the were willing umbrella. to work at a price that like, if it, you get a good yeah, deal, exactly, of course. And then no, it's like, well, sense. then it just makes sense. You'll find something for them to do. But to go out of our way to find a podcast producer, so like that's what I'm asking, right? So yeah. like, if if you took your contractor that was making let's say five hundred dollars right now for their work, and said, hey, can you take on this amount of responsibilities? That's going to take. We'll give them five hundred more, but that five hundred you can turn into five thousand or fifteen thousand or some excess amount of money. You can flip that money, and and their responsibilities will return you ten, fifteen, twenty x. That makes sense. But like to hire a producer to run the show. And, and pay them a normal salary that I would consider maybe five, eight thousand dollars between that area that they could run the show because of the size of the show. I mean, you don't have a small view count, right? You have a lot of views, and so you know that producer would then respond to you know the the questions, the comments. It would take on your role essentially, right? And you would become more of like a gram role, 
you know so that would that would be the only way i see this you know transition yeah. at what roi do you see it worth it like obviously spending let's just say 50 grand to make 50 grand that's that's no, not good no, no. so you need 10. I, in my my book like i don't start a new project unless i'm getting 10x right like i was offered to invest in so many things in the past couple of months and you know at 10 percent return at 20 percent return it, it's just it's not worth the risk right so for you to take on that responsibility hiring someone is more risky than an investment right because you're taking on their livelihood mm -hmm. right unless it's a contractor and it's a very small amount of money and they understand that but like when you're talking about taking on someone full time this becomes their job they have to pay their rent they have to pay their stuff and you're responsible for their bills their lifestyle right so you have to commit to them as well as they have to commit to you so you have to see at least 10x from that position you know like if they're paying them 5 you got to return 50 so they've got to be getting you extra sponsors right they've got to be reaching out to to I don't know, someone that is going to bring in more money, right? So I hired a producer for my YouTube and, and you know, digital business, yeah. right? And they signed um, a deal with the company that brought me $200,000 in ads, right? Over a course of time. So I paid that person, you know, $25,000, right? It's like a 12% commission mm -hmm. for that, right? Because I got this long-term contract. So that was worth it, right? I mean, would you give me 12 grand if I gave you back 200? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, right. So like, I think the same thing has to follow. Like with the Patreon right now, it's only bringing you 1600 or $2,000, right? So that responsibility is probably going to have to lie on you. But if it starts to bring in 10, 12, 15, 20,000, then you can afford to say, look, this is auxiliary income. We didn't expect this, right? We should use this money together to add someone to help us oversee this business and grow it. You know, that's my opinion. I think 10 X return is totally feasible. I agree. I think for a, for a producer. Is, yeah. Yeah. I think it's absolutely. Feasible. I don't, I don't see it. What I think is that the, since I've been here for three months ago or two months ago, right. You've, you've increased the, the, the podcast has gained 30% more income, yeah. but that's total but, amount. I mean, that's, that's, but, and it's solely, but, that's YouTube. But, ad but revenue. I don't know what exactly. a producer that's would give us. completely different from sponsorships, which I don't know what a producer would, would get for us that we can't already do with what we're already doing. But we aren't doing it. What aren't we doing? Okay. Well, first of all, for a thing uh midweeks every single week we sometimes been, we just don't have anything to talk about that's that's nothing a producer would would well hold the producer to. needs to tell you yeah, that's yeah, what i'm saying the exactly. producer needs the producer to find would, the content right yeah. i mean they have to reach out to guys like myself or alex or whoever's going to come on this show and say look we need to schedule wednesday and saturday or wednesday and sunday there that producer needs to fill this seat every week twice a week that's their job, yeah. right? They need to break down the content. They need to say, look, Houston, you're gonna talk about these topics today, right? And be prepared for these topics because this is what we wanna talk about, you know? And for me, just to come on here and talk, I mean, we're friends. So, you know, we have mutual respect. We have a lot in common. We can make that conversation. But when it's someone you've never met before, this someone is the needs first to do time, research, they, they need to come up with exactly, talking they need points. To know I would say, have, have Andrew do it. I don't want, okay. So the also, also another thing is you have to consider the workload that some of your contractors or for some other people, employees are bearing, right? Of course. And just to automatically add more workload in, I think is is dangerous. I think I it don't could want be a, to burn out my. I my, think it could be a great test. It tests the proof of concept, and if they like it, it's a step up. And if they don't, then or if it doesn't work, or if we're not seeing the ROI, then we lose nothing, and and they get the benefit of trying it out. Sometimes you have to burn the I'm, burn I'm the not, burn the wick at both ends yeah. to see what works. I agree. Because if Graham we take on, on yeah, you you. In, in my opinion, you know, when you have contractors, right? I mean, obviously if that contractor has 10 other clients, right? You have to know that, right? You, you can't take a contractor that's already at 80 hour workload and be like, hey, here's 20 more, mm -hmm. right? They're just, they're not gonna perform for you, right? They're not gonna perform for the other people and then they're gonna get stressed and their work's gonna just be worthless. So you definitely wanna get someone who can commit to you and say, look, I'm gonna give, you go to your, your contractor, Andrew, and say, look, Andrew, I'm gonna give you three months, okay? I'm gonna pay you this much money and I want this result. If you can contribute to that, then we can bring you on full time and you don't have to worry about the other clients that you have. We can afford to pay you this much and you'd be solely, you know, working for us or, you know, a balance. Fifty percent of your income will come from us, right? So that should be for you guys, in my personal opinion, is twice a week. Consistency is what's gonna pay you, mm -hmm. right? Consistency is what's gonna get you those ads, those better views, it's better everything, right? And you need diversity, right? I mean, the iced coffee hour is amazing. You've got diversity right now. I mean, you've got some really cool people on here. But like I said, I mean, you need some people that are gonna bring the view ratio. I mean, I guarantee if you look at this particular portion 
of the podcast and watch the view count or you know watch the the duration it's going to spike how oh, people always love our <clears throat> it's, topics it's great like i mean this, we're yeah. we're talking with emotion right now and we're talking about something interesting but we're also solving a problem you know so if you can get that producer to do some research on let's say some person get some background right find someone with some drama like what happened with this i remember there was a guy on here that had like a bunch of drama um at one time and you were a lot of yep. people were commenting negatively yeah, about it, right? Tech lead. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't really know. I didn't. I didn't really understand that because I don't know what happened before. But I, I watched it. Yeah. And I, I thought it was like interesting. But like that producer needs to know what's happening in that person's life, what they're into. Interview them first. Talk about their stuff and bring you that content so you guys can utilize that here and not just hope for the best that's when the great. camera turns on. That I, I agree 100%. Yes. Yeah. Also because if we do too much research on our own end, then it makes the it's entire conversation planned. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So I agree a producer would be great for that role. And also it's the structure. It's like, I think that there are a few things that I, I like to think I'm at least uniquely good at. I have a competitive advantage in, right? Mm -hmm. And I think structure is like the exact opposite of what I have a competitive advantage in. And that's what a producer needs that's and it. i think that's why i really don't think that i would be good at structuring out these guests giving out time that's slots fair. posting but, on patreon at certain times I think, and you know yeah. i don't have great i know structure. but i think it's a 15 hour a week job that's what i think i in I terms just of outreach and all I of do this have, so my, the contract that we would pass this on to does great work yes. do amazing work and i don't want to just throw you know a Throw them into a spiral Give them an option, because I right. That's well, what of course, I would, like, I, would, I would present the opportunity to, like, hey, look, to them. But you got to commit to him. I mean, if you're going to have him do this, you got to give him three months yeah. and say you're guaranteed. Now, after month one, if he sucks, you've got to deal with him for month two. And then after month two, if he sucks, you got to give him that third month. Yeah. It's going to take someone some time to get used to their role, mm -hmm. right? They might have the skill set and not know how to utilize it yet. They might, you know, have a bad first two, three weeks and get discouraged. But them guaranteeing, you guys guaranteeing them three months to give them the idea to figure yeah. it out is going to help him come into that role. Yeah. Right? I like a three month test. I think within three months, by the end of it, we should see whether or not it's working. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is a, th this is a really cool thing you've got going on. And I would love to see this expanded, right? I mean, just for my own personal entertainment, right? These are 90 one hour and two hour videos mm -hmm. that are very engaging, right? And and you have the potential to take this to a very, very high level, right? That no one really has. I mean, Graham, Graham's celebrity in this industry is is worth watching just to hear his opinion, right? Because obviously he does so much research. So if you can get that same back end for for the other side of this, I think that'd be great. I'm open to it. Part of it is difficult for me because I really take a lot of pride in keeping things small and like the team is right here. Yeah. And so that is what I think has kept us like really grounded and yeah, connected but that's with the to Jack too. You know, I mean, this is his business. Right? Yes. So that's you true. have so many other things going on. Yeah. You have so much other income from other places. It's it's unfair to to both these guys, right? Because their income's coming from here. Yeah. Right. And so it's you need to obviously build it for them as well. I mean, he's putting in more work physically than you are mm -hmm. right and you're getting the same benefit if not more you know whatever it is right so at the end of the day i think um being small is cool because you have all those things but mm -hmm. You know, Jack has a Miata, so like. <laughs> <laughs> and Alexis. <laughs> I told him by a Lotus Elise, but uh, didn't listen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's good, man. Cool. I'm, I'm happy. Thank you for your insights yeah, on this. Really good insight. Yeah. 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 So if, uh, if you guys ever need anybody to uh, mediate, you know. I right like here. this. Thank you, man. Yeah. yeah. I I'm got gonna... a couple of random finance questions for you. Let's do it. Okay. So if you were to get a pie of all of your assets, how would like the slices be arranged? All right. Um, so I have 60% uh, in cars because I know that business the best. I have 20% in cash. And then I have about 10% in commercial real estate. And then the other 10% in like NFT bullshit. Mm. What about your house? I don't own a home. Rents? Yeah, I rent right now. How much is your rent? 30000 a month yeah my theory <laughs> it's a nice big house man i have yeah. a cool house and like to, to my defense on the rental uh it's not that i don't want to own a home but basically to own a i, I live in a little over seven million dollar house and like that house would be 30 percent down to do a mortgage on and at the rates that i when i started renting was about four and a half percent the mortgage would have been more than i rent and that 30% down would have been around two, 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 three, two, two million. 
And I feel like with the two and a half million dollars, I can make $30,000 a month with ease. Yeah. So I save that money. I rent this house. It pays for itself. You know, it's free to me. Right. And um, I know I don't get the benefits of write offs, right, with the interest and all that stuff. But if I were to buy, like, I considered buying like a cheap $2 million house, like in, in like a, a nice neighborhood to kind of like, chill out in cheap right cheap two million dollars well in comparison to Ascaya, <laughs> yeah. right the cheapest right. house in the sky is actually the one i live in currently yeah it was seven million right because like the other ones are like 10 12 15 whatever there's only 30 something houses in that neighborhood but like the i have the cheapest one and so you know i was thinking to myself like maybe if i just take this money and i hold on to it right right now in cash i have just about two million bucks right i, I just bought this pagani and um so i took a i put half down on the Pagani and I financed the rest and I did the same with my Koenigsegg. So, you know, I, I don't want to leverage too, too hard on those cars, but I also don't want to put down too much money yeah. as well. And so like, I was thinking to myself, you know, like my, my overall like debt load, you know, my Pagani is 20,000 and my Koenigsegg is 35,000 a month. And those are the only two cars I have financed. And so like, I'm thinking to myself, like, how do I, you know, the rest of them are, are paid for as like an investment, you know, like the GTRs, the Ford mm -hmm. GTs and all those things. Veyron. Yeah, the Veyron. Um, the Veyron I built, so it's a little bit unique. But um, to leverage that, you know, I can write off the cars, like the, the 35 and the 20. I can write that off because I use them for YouTube, right? So those are great write-offs for me. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I have like a good balance, you know, and I know the liquidity of those things, right? With houses and with real estate, like I have a commercial piece of land that I'm building a, a dispensary, a liquor store on, right? It's a ridiculous location. It's like, it was like winning the lottery for me to get this piece of land. Mm. And that's paid for, no debt, you know, and I'm building the building with no debt. So I feel like at the end of the day, you know, my situation is based on my geographical location in Las Vegas, right? And the ability that I have to move around with that, you know? And all that 10% that of NFTs and crypto and investments was just a waste, mm. you know? I mean, hopefully it'll turn yeah. around and do something. But like I bought a board Ape. Mm. Why? How much was it? 800. No. Yeah. <gasps> 800 grand i was thinking like 300, no, I, 300. I, I partnered with uh wow. steve aoki and another guy and so um we have a we have a board ape together i have actually three board apes i got a i got wow. a mutant and i have two mutants and then yeah. uh, the red have you gone one. to any of the events what does it do for you Nothing. have, have any ape? anything it doesn't do loses anything. money uh, so why do you buy it just uh because i'm i was like all into this nft crypto thing like for a little while and i was like super stoked about it and i bought it because i thought someone was going to pay more that's the problem yeah. with the world man and what happened yeah. to these well they're worth the same amount of money in ethereum if not more i think they're actually i think my board ape is actually worth more than i paid for it we paid 200 ethereum but ethereum is four thousand dollars when i bought it so if i get 200 ethereum back i'll have one quarter of my money right so if i get 250 ethereum back i'll have made a profit on my Ethereum, but then the Ethereum value is so low. Right. I end up losing money. So that's it's a an interesting story. way to look at it. Yeah. Because if you if you're gonna keep your money in Ethereum anyway, True. you just want that Ethereum back plus some. Yeah. Regardless of its value. That's it. That's a really interesting way to I mean, think about it. There was a board ape that was sold recently for um eight hundred Ethereum or eight hundred and sixty Ethereum. It was a gold one. So that that tells me that people are still buying them, right? But that's 860,000 versus like 2.5 right. million. It's really for the people putting money in Ethereum now. So now they're able to buy it cheaper unless mm -hmm. they already had their money in Ethereum and it was worth whatever anyway. I mean, I don't see NFTs are a weird thing. Um, there's this taxable thing. There's a lot of like art. There's a lot of balances around NFTs. And then J Gary Vernerchuk talks about Web3 and like a bunch of stuff with that. I mean, there's there's some future, I think, with NFTs. But at the end of the day right now, I mean, I'm a pretty firm believer that NFT is just a JPEG on the internet. Yeah. I don't think there's I any think intrinsic value yeah, of it. The value all. of the NFT is in verifying who's the owner. Mm -hmm. And so I think what like like if you buy a Gucci bag or a Rolex, there should be an NFT with that Agreed. that verifies that you are the owner of that Rolex Agreed. that is yours. Well, it's Same like, with I mean, any and it, the it should blockchain. cost nothing to to do that on a large scale. Like any designer item should have an NFT with it. Yep. Which makes the most sense because yeah. then you can, the, the product itself is raised. Right. It's going right? to really help with counterfeits. It would eliminate yeah. counterfeits. Right. I mean, people would, it would be just, you have a counterfeit or you don't yeah. have a counterfeit. But right? like imagine changing title for a car, but that's done on the blockchain. Oh, it'd be so much yeah. better. Oh my gosh.
It would be a dream. Instant. You would have YouTube videos. I don't. I don't. I don't see the. I don't see the reason of the content. Why would you do that? that? I don't know. There's a way you could give licensing or ownership to to someone. Uh, That would be interesting, but I don't know how each video would be treated separately. So, like, someone could buy my video, let's just say, and they get the ad revenue on that. It's kind of like a song. Yeah. That's actually. I'm sure there's a way to do it, but uh, that's the thing. Right now, there's so many great ideas. Right, it's just executing them and, and bringing them into a mass market to actually mm-hmm. monetize them are so difficult. You know, I think Board Ape did a really good job of building a brand. Right, I mean, they built a brand. It's not just the NFT. They built a, a brand around the apes, and and they, they they've contributed so well. And the reason people want Board Apes is, is, and the reason why I wanted to buy a Board Ape is because they airdrop so much value. Right, so the mutant serums that we got were free. Right. And intrinsically, those those turned into thirty, forty thousand dollar assets. Um, they airdropped ApeCoin, right, based on your uh, the value you paid or I don't know how exactly they did it. But I, I got my portion was twenty six thousand dollars in ApeCoin for free. And that was when it was only twelve dollars when mm-hmm. I first got it. Right. And it actually went to twenty something dollars. So I sold it immediately because I didn't want to hold it. But yeah, I got twenty six thousand dollars like real money for free, right? And so like d- these guys that are airdropping auxiliary items because they want the residuals, right? They want them traded back and forth so they get the commissions, right? The NFT structure is so good for the creator because of commissions. You know, for me, I would love to change my rental car business into like a membership program with an NFT. You know, I've thought about it and it just it takes a very intelligent person, it's way smarter than me to really fine tune that business plan but i mean imagine just having a card like a like i bought one of the nelk boys cards just to have it right it was like three thousand bucks it was one Mm -hmm. one uh eth at the time yeah and um it allows me to have access to all their events which they haven't thrown an event from my understanding or whatever i don't know one did they yeah with snoop dog okay cool so yeah i was able i would have been able to go to that but like if i did that for my rental car business and i created like a meta card and it gave you access to, see, I think that the real good version of this would be car sales. You have access to, you're part of my dealership network, right? And I sell you cars based on the auction value, right? Versus based on the retail value. So you give me 3,001 Ethereum, right? You hold this card, you buy it, and um, you hold it until you want to purchase a car or you purchase many cars, right? And it gives you access to buy these cars from me at, at a 12 to 13, 15% discount from retail, right? And save all those fees, you know? So I think that there's a good business plan for that. And then it allows you to rent cars at cost or allows you to rent private jets at cost. You know, being a member in this and being very limited would make sense. And it'd make those cards value grow, right? So if you paid 3,000, someone might pay you 5,000 because they're looking to buy a Mercedes and they don't have the ability to buy it at an auction. They'll buy my card and then get a Mercedes from me and save 15,000. Right. So like there's like so many cool ideas to do with NFTs and blockchains and cards and everything. But it sucks to like market against the industry. Yeah. You know, you have like that push of where I've got a great idea, but how do I combat all of the fraud that's in the industry and the notion that NFTs are fake or whatever they are going on in the media? Right. How do I say that I have a really good idea? This is a good product, but I'm, you know, I'm trying to battle that as well. So it's difficult to like scale it, sure. you know? Are there any business ideas that you're not doing that you wouldn't mind sharing? That you um, might think is a good idea, it's just you don't have the resources for it. Well, that was a good one, actually. Yeah. Um, I do think that um, we need to create a, bring a trailer. Have you been on that website? Uh, all the time. For houses. Would be difficult without Why? the without the inspection. They, they no, no, used to we, have- You do an inspection pre, pre the listing. Think about this. They've tried doing that in the past. All of them have failed. Yeah, but they Um, haven't done it like bring a trailer, right? Now, it's bring a trailer is so easy because it's so simple and the commission that bring a trailer takes is very minuscule. But with cars, it's a lot easier to place a bid than with a house to make sure that buyer's pre-approved because you don't necessarily need to sell for the highest price. You want to sell to the buyer who's going to close. Of course. And so if someone offers 100K, but the best buyer is 90K, all cash, no contingencies, you need to view all the offers and, and select the ones based on who's most likely to close. That's just the, that just depends on the type of house and the type of buyer you want because you can open your house up and limit it, right? I mean, if, if we posted a house that was $200,000 and you wanted to only accept a certain amount of offer, your buyer pool would just be able to bid on that, right? You'd have different levels. I only want cash offers and this is the price that the cash offers would take, you know? 
Like it just, I think it just has to be different ground rules. Yeah, it's you know? it's tough because you need MLS exposure on those, and you generally have MLS the exposure. generally with the auctions, you don't get the same level of interest because people are waiting for a certain date. It I think it was auction dot com that used mm -hmm. to do this throughout like twenty ten to twenty thirteen. It was really popular. Yeah, but see, now it's but like those different. were but those were bank owned properties, and Correct. they never and and a lot of those banks just had to do that because they had no other options, so yeah. they just put them up there with a really low reserve. But now in today's economy, I just, I can't see that. Working. I just think that the auction mentality is normal now, right? eBay was the only auction in a long time ago, right? Now everything is sold at like a bidding price, right? So I do think that there's like, plus just because you get the hundred thousand dollar winner doesn't mean, you know, that person has to close. I mean, you have the other two, three backup people. Look, you, we don't have to think through this right now, Yeah. but I'm just saying that I think that because of the the way that the pandemic changed our mentality, no one knows what, you know, it maybe it doesn't have to be an auction where you win. It's more of like you put it up for 14 days mm -hmm. and this is my bid. And then you pick through those, right? It's just like a public offering system, right? So it's, it's on the MLS. And instead of writing a contingent offer through the real estate agent, not knowing like I wanted to buy a house a couple weeks ago for an investment and I, I, Put in a specific offer and the real estate was like nah man we got way better offers than that well what if they didn't and what if it was public and what if it was like my offer was the strongest but they were trying to screw me and get me a better one well even so, if it is public you could always tell your friend to go and bid on a house or you know correct. submit something yeah i mean i don't know i think you just like bring a trailer charges you for the bids which is super cool like when you make a bid you have to pay for it now, if you don't win, well, they give you your money back. Yeah, well, it's right? just the deposit. Yeah, what is it? I don't know. Five grand, or it's they put a they put a hold yeah. up to a certain amount, or it's a five percent of the I price. Just, I feel like there's something there. There's some way to make it to where we could eliminate the realtor's opinion in a purchase. I think that's the real problem. I'm very against realtors because yeah. their opinion is the issue. I don't think so. I think it's their expertise <laughs> that you really pay for. The expertise, it's, it's yeah. The, it's the expertise. So, now, obviously, but but just the same thing like with any business. There are good business people and there are terrible ones. Yeah. I think with real estate, there's 99.999% of realtors are, are based on their well, own pockets. I, I mean, know? the reality is 20% <laughs> of the agents are really doing the majority of, of the business and the top 5% do the I mean, vast what do you, majority of it. What do you think of people that are buying their houses for... Let's say in 2021, they bought their house for 1.4 and then they posted it for 3.2 today. Is that a problem with the agent or a problem with the seller? No, that's a problem with the market. I don't think it's the agent but, or the seller. I mean, if, if that if that house is worth $3 million, they would be- they would They're be, just asking $3 million, right? And hoping well, for the best. I mean, there's no there's no comps based on that, right? If they could, well, obviously the market's going to always dictate what people get. So a lot of times for my sellers, they would say, well, I want to list it. You know, why Why list it this price versus this other price? Because the market will always dictate it, but it's, it's marketing. So if, you're, if your home is worth 1.1 and you listed it at 999, your home is going to sell way over based on what the market's worth. If you overprice your home, the market over. will eventually sell what it's worth, but then you're wasting all the momentum in the beginning. Yeah. So I think a lot of it is strategy. There is an element to marketing that you have to, just like with anything. But I think the expertise is in figuring out where the balance is, and then the market will dictate what the home is worth. Your home is not worth, you know, a million dollars if it sits on the market for six months. It was never worth that to begin with. Yeah, I or agree. it could be really bad marketing, and you miss the market in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I, I just right now it seems like everybody's just shooting for the stars, and they're like, oh, in this market. I mean, in this market means that the government gave everybody six trillion dollars, and they spent it, and they were like, oh, well, hey, this is worth this much money because I have this extra money. Yeah, but a lot right? of those are based on comps, and so if you if I mean, you have it just some takes one guy to buy one house to get one comp, and then another one no, to get daisy chain comp effect. You're never looking at just one house, especially in a place like Vegas. You're looking at the almost the entire city and what you could get. You're probably looking at ten to thirty different comps and taking the average of all of those based on the square footage. I don't know, but I just think that's not happening right now. I don't, if you're looking at a, it. it's, but you could always pick one off comps if you want to, like, let's say a sky, you could look at one sale because there's, there's What's really nothing in there. It's so funny about a sky yeah. is they're not selling. <laughs> that's right. The, but, but you could, but you could look at the one that sold and say, based on this one that sold, but when you expand beyond a half a mile and you see, wait a second, everything else is selling for 20% less. Yeah. How do we compare with that? So you could always find a one off comp and sometimes sellers will do that. And that's unrealistic, but overall, you got to look at 20 or 30 different homes. I agree. So, it just I don't think that's happening yeah. right Half now. Half the time, by the way, or I would say probably 90% of the time, the homes being priced high are not the agents. The agents, if anything, have a financial incentive to price it low. It's the sellers. 
and agents are like, well, crap, do I just not want to take the listing? Because if they don't take the listing, someone, someone else, will. else will. Of course. So yeah. they're just like, well, I may as well take the listing at this high price the seller insists on. And then maybe I could talk some sense after a few weeks. Mm -hmm. They don't get an offer and we could come down to something more realistic. But these are sellers who have no idea what they're doing. And if anything, if they have better guidance from an agent or a consultant, they might not price their home that high because the agents have a better pulse of what's going on and they don't want to waste three weeks or let's even say months of their time and energy and they money. They actually pay. I mean, the agents are paying their marketing. They're paying, Absolutely. they're doing that. So, I mean, it's costing so them money too. If anything, it's better for the agents to price lower, but it's the sellers. I mean, just from just anecdotal stuff that I've seen, it just seems like people have an unrealistic expectation of what their home is worth based on values six months ago and they're sticking with it. And there aren't enough agents, and agents are desperate for any listings. If they're, if they're, you know, maybe not doing as well, they'll take anything. So, and those I are the people agree, that yeah. say, well, okay, let's go ahead and do it. But the good agents, and from at least what I've seen, uh, will turn down listings. If they don't believe they could sell it in a realistic time frame, they'll just say no. It makes them look bad. Right. You know, there's a, there's a group of agents here in town that just take everything high end and they just post it for whatever the price they want. I mean, yeah. it's like astronomical numbers and it just takes one to sell, right? For them to get good money. But at the end of the day, it's like, it's it's wild of how much people want. I, I just don't think that people understand how the housing market like should work, right? As, as buyers, you know, it shouldn't go up 150% in one year, right? Like houses shouldn't raise that much because they that, shouldn't, that means- but, but that doesn't mean they can't or they, they, that's- Of course they can't, but. Now, when you buy it at that price, it's going to come down, right? Because it can't do it again. Well, it just depends on what your mortgage rate is. I mean, if you buy a home at a 2.5% mortgage rate and your payment's you know, $5,000 a month, let's just say, and even if home prices go down 20%, but interest rates are now 6%, your payment could be the exact same. Yeah, yeah. So I it just, really just like depends. 20% drops based on like, like I don't know. I, I guess because I'm on the other side of the fence, right? I want to be a buyer right? Sometimes. And I want to be a seller sometimes, yeah. you know, everybody wants to, to, to hold both cards, right? You, you want to be the one that sells the highest amount and want to buy the cheapest house. So it's, it's tough. I just, I've lived in Vegas so long mm -hmm. that we used to be a city of value and now it's like cheaper to live in California. Like I wouldn't say that. Hey, foot. no, I you wouldn't know? say no. Gosh, no, <laughs> gosh, no, not at all. It's, it's way cheaper here. It's my joke, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I've never seen the five, eight, nine, 1,000 a square foot. It was like 250, 300. And now every house is 500 plus. Yeah. You know, I think there's an element to that that can be sustained just because of how many people are continuing to move here. Sure. Um, and I think generally the worse California gets, the better Vegas is going to do. Yeah. So well, I want more people to come here. I, I want them because they're going to eat at my restaurants, right. right? I mean, the more overpopulated Vegas gets, the more dense it gets. But I will say eat there. the one thing that would hurt Nevada is if they get rid of the uh, the salt cap. So if they get rid of that in California, they bring down taxes a little bit and they improve the areas, I think we'll start to see either fewer people moving out of state or maybe you might see some of the people that left coming back. Yeah, I actually can see that. I mean, right now in my my research, all I see is homes that were purchased in 2020 and 2021 for sale in 2022. Like there really isn't anybody selling a home that bought it before 2020. I mean, it just like nobody, right? And some people are just buying a house and three months later putting it back for sale, right? Like that's yeah. just Well, I think a lot of that is just the the surprise and the shock of just, wow, how much money I just made in such a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Like for the properties that I had bought in 2016 or 17, it's less of a shock because you've seen the incremental price, you're used to it. But when you buy a home two years ago, it's like, wow, in two years, I just made $600,000. Maybe it's a good time I sell. Yeah. I think those are the people or more likely to sell. My theory is that everybody's like moved to Vegas and realized that it wasn't a good idea to live here because the summer it's hot or this or that, or they don't like the something about the city and they're moving back or they're moving somewhere else. I've never seen anybody move back. Yeah. People that know. I've seen sell or are selling they because they either have too much space, they bought too big of a house, um, they, they maybe learn the area a little bit better and they want to move somewhere else. Those are the people that I'm seeing selling. I just, I don't see how you sell it a high amount with a 3% mortgage and go into a 6% mortgage at a higher amount. I don't, I don't see the, the mentality well, that's, for but that. But that's why a lot of people are also just not selling. 
Yeah. Like I wouldn't want to sell this house. I I've been so tempted to be, just because of values going up, but I would hate to move and I don't I have a 2.8% mortgage on this. So it's it did like like a million dollars more at least. Yeah, so it's just like it doesn't make sense to sell. So I like I don't want to get rid of that mortgage. I agree. You know, that's why I think people should stay. Yeah. And then then bring the prices of the houses down a little bit because the more people Well, are, if they the, the more they stay, the less inventory there's going to be. So you'd want people to leave and list their homes because if everyone is like, well, I'm going to give up my mortgage, then there'll be way more inventory and prices would come down. Yeah, but if people stay, then they don't need a new house. Well, if people stay, if 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 people stay, then there's going to be less inventory. So anyone who does want to move is going to have less to pick from. In, in my own perfect scenario, uh, which is probably not going to happen, prices stay the same and maybe increase. Like, let's just say the floor is now a million bucks. Sure. That floor stays the same and maybe increases at a rate of two to four percent the year after that. Just basically in line with what I would consider to be a reasonable inflation. Yeah. That's what I would like to see. So we don't see a crash, but we don't see prices continuing to skyrocket. We just see stability. Do you think we're in a recession? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Do you think that they're gonna announce something that says we're in a recession? Uh, I think it's September that they actually come out and make the the proper announce, the official announcement. Do you think but by then like, it's usually too late. Like Right, yeah. It's it's, it's it seems it's like too yeah. far gone. Right. Know? Uh usually they they've found that once they announce we're in a recession, the worst is already over. Yeah. Um and that the the peak tends to happen six months prior to the worst of a recession. Mm -hmm. So So right now? Like this could well, be the, I mean, depends. The, the the peak of the market was back in, let's say, November, December, January. We're, we're past six months of that. Who knows? I mean, it could continue to get worse. It's just, it's difficult to, I guess, dictate what's happening outside of America, right? Like, I mean, you have these wars, you have all this stuff going on, and that's out of our control. And that really drives our market down, you know? Yeah. So it's like, well, there's so many other factors today, yeah. right? Well, I think a lot of it is the fear and yeah. higher interest rates. Yeah. And I mean, do you think I th they're going to go to nine, ten percent? No. Or think they're going to hit stop at like seven? No, I don't. There's this mortgage guy I follow in Los Angeles. He's one of like the biggest mortgage brokers, and he sent an email I think two months ago saying that from his experience of like forty years in the mortgage industry, that he believes mortgage mortgage rates have already peaked, and that they've already priced in all the future Fed rate increases, and that we're not going to see seven or eight percent mortgages. He thinks, honestly, mortgages are gonna stay between five and six and a half percent, maybe bob a little bit, plus or minus, you know, a tad in between there. I could see that becoming true. Well, I, I mean, noticed that they yeah. lowered the rate a couple of last rates, week. Yes, or, mortgage rates dropped from, I think, six and a half to like five, five and a half point, percent. Yeah, five point something. Uh, in a matter of a few weeks. <clears throat> It's just because demand was drying up and yeah. so mortgage rates came down. So I mean, it really makes sense the, to me. Jerome Powell raising the rates, right? He's raising the prime rate, right? So the bank is adding their fees, Correct. right? So the bank is the one dictating the five, six, seven, eight, yeah. right? That's where the bank's money's at. So the bank sees zero demand or less demand. Yeah. They're going to lower those rates off the prime rate. The bank's going to make less money and, you know, interest rates. Yeah, it's it's all going to be supply and demand. Um, so I think if we see less demand, um, we're going to see mortgage rates come down. So I think that's that's pretty true. I think the hardest part is going to be if the Fed raises the rates, let's say 3.5%, 4%. Um, when you have a savings account that's offering 35 to 4% interest, it's going to pull a lot of money away from the market. Like, Why would you invest in stocks to maybe make 7 to 8% when you could get a guaranteed 35 to 4 mm -hmm. in the savings account and have access to your money and not lose it? Uh, people forget, I think it was 2018, a savings account was the best investment you could have made. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> no idea. making 2018. Yeah, 2018. That's crazy. savings wow. account was the big because the stock market went down, uh, asset prices went down, real estate went down. I think it was like a percent or something negligible, but a savings account was the only profitable thing you could have invested in that year, wow. and that made like one and a half percent, two percent. Wow. Bitcoin, or no, that was when that was Bitcoin down. Was like yeah, yeah. the savings that was the best invest. So sometimes people forget it's like that can be. Now, obviously, that also would have been a really good time to invest in the stock market because it was underperforming. Look at it now. Mm -hmm. So I like so much diversity. That's the that's why I like chicken so much, right? Because you could do medium, mild, yeah, <laughs> really just, hot. So much diversity. So much diversity. Yeah. Right. I don't. Know, you just if like the Miami is performing well, just throw a restaurant in Miami, right? If if overseas is performing well, international expansion, right? I mean, it's just it's not bad everywhere. Right, that's what's good about chicken is that you can just move it around, just like stocks or bonds mm -hmm. or all these things. I mean, not everybody's going to do bad, right? In a recession, it's only half or a portion of companies go down and a portion of companies go up. 
you know? Yeah. So you just have to move your money around and, and that's the best way, you know? So I don't think I have any other businesses that I, I want to do other than like, I did want to start like a shoe cleaning company. No one cleans shoes. Like there's dry cleaners. There's like car washes. There's like everybody, but mm. nobody would actually you cleans buy that shoes. Service? Oh yeah. Would, he's doing <sighs> See Houston shoe collection, just, man. You guys don't understand. That's, I think that's where the biggest problem in my life is, is uh, this addiction to shoes that I have. What? Okay. So that's, the, I, that's are, probably like a real issue. Are you into fashion? Yeah. I mean, it's ironic that the first, <laughs> no one knows this. Everybody's going to know now, but I, I went to fashion school for a few weeks. Mm. That was, my dad actually manufactured denim. And so he was a, a, a very world renowned, like denim designer. And he had like a bunch of manufacturing uh, facilities in LA and made denim. He, he's 74. So he retired like when I was in high school still. And um, so I originally wanted to be in the denim industry. So, you know, I wanted to kind of like do that. And I went to fashion school for a couple of weeks and just realized LA wasn't for me. Like fit him was like really cool, but it just well, fit him. Yeah. Wasn't my big. vibe. Yeah. You know, but uh, so yeah, anyways, I, I love fashion. So what is it about shoes that has such an allure to people? Because I know shoes are really popular amongst like shoes you know, are fashionistas. like watches, right? It's an accessory because, okay. So like, let me put it in perspective. Like a really cool designer t-shirt is like $500, right? It's like very expensive for a t-shirt. But those t-shirts have no resale value, right? Jeans, few, five, three to $400 for jeans, no resale value. Shoes for some reason are like watches and they have resale value. They actually can be worth more money than you pay for them. Like a lot of different types of shoes are like that. So there's this collector-esque about it, right? And you can, now obviously if you don't wear them, they're worth way more money, right? But if you do wear them, they're still worth money. So this is why shoes are so popular now is that like I have a couple of employees that flip shoes for a side hustle. Like it's a thing, mm. you know? And um, like there's a new uh, Supreme or a Virgil collab with Louis Vuitton coming out. And I was told that some of those shoes would be worth upwards of $50,000 for a pair. That's a legitimate mm. business. When you buy a pair of shoes for a few thousand dollars, one to two or whatever they are cost from Louis Vuitton and are able to sell them for 50,000. I don't know where the buyers are for that, but it's a real thing, you know? And so I think that there's no one that caters to those guys, right? I mean, if you have 15, 20, 30, 50 pairs of shoes, you can't throw them in the washer, right? And there's no service that comes to your house and like in a van and just clean them, you know? So I think that's a good business idea for someone. I thought about doing like a small franchise where I buy like a bunch of like 20 year old kids, their first job, get a van, get them all their equipment and everything, and then start like an app. And then people just want to like go wash their shoes and then send a van out. Mm. Kind of like a mobile car wash service. But I don't know if that's very effective. You would be the biggest customer. <laughs> there's a lot. Actually, there's yeah. so many people. Like there, I would definitely be a huge customer. Um, right now, um, I, um, I have a, a guy that that basically does other things for me, kind of like a handyman type guy. And he 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 does that particular job for me. Wow. Yeah, so I give him 10, $12 a shoe, depending on which one it is. But I'm gonna have 250 pairs, 300 pairs of shoes. So mm -hmm. it adds up for him over the month, you know? Gosh. Yeah. I just have a question. Yeah. Like th this is random, because it could go one way or the other. Houston, how much did your shirt cost you? The t-shirt? Yeah, it just looks like a black t-shirt. 12 bucks, 13 okay. bucks. Yeah, I mean, that's what I don't. Okay. I, you never I try know. not to wear like I love really nice like suit coats like sport coats like Versace and really high end designer things but I don't want to like this T shirt is just such a bad investment to buy a five hundred dollar version of this yeah right just because it says a brand I don't need a brand to tell me that I'm like cool or something right but I do like the quality and like a really nice suit jacket like when I wear to my grand openings like those Versace jackets have gold in them and right. they're very unique and they're very special and and they kind of accentuate my personality right but like my jeans are $110 you know they're guests or whatever they cost like they're normal but like the shoes is like a watch right where it's like an accessory and you know every time I come here I wear a different cool pair yeah. of shoes and they're all so fancy and yeah, they all got spikes on them yeah so how much does your entire outfit cost well you're gonna count the watch oh, well if you count the watch it costs more than a house but um I don't know I've got uh, like probably $130 worth of clothes on and then a, I don't know, essentially a $440,000 watch. What kind of watch is that? It's a, <laughs> it's a RM. Oh um, gosh, that's what I thought. Yeah, I mean, this is a carbon one. So it's not, not the most expensive. Uh, there's RMs that cost millions. How much did yeah. you pay for it? 
this watch I paid uh, one ninety something one. So it's like this watch I believe was a sticker price of like I think it was one twenty something, mm-hmm. and I paid like sixty over sticker. I'm on the wait list for like a good new one, but they try to give us like RM gave me a, a, a allocation for a watch that was like kind of like the dinky one and that doesn't go up in value. So I'd rather pay 60 over. Yeah. This watch was purchased yeah. before the now, big boom. Now here's the thing, why, cause you're selling off some cars, why wouldn't you sell off the watch? I only have one. I used to have 13. Watches? Yes. Okay. So I've kept one watch that I just wear every day and I kept my first watch I ever bought. So that one I don't wear. It just, it's a, it's a Hublot, it's like 30 grand and I financed it on my credit card. I was like super stoked and you know, it was like a big moment for me to buy like a really nice watch. Mm-hmm. But I used to have a whole bunch of watches and I just have one now. So whenever I like go out, I I don't know, I, I'd like to have two. One that's not just like one black one and like one gold one maybe that's like sure. more luxurious. But I just wear this watch every day, you know? And I mean, it's a lot, it's worth a lot of value now, but like I couldn't replace it. And I feel like I, I just need one watch. And I think that's the key in any, any personal success, you could have a billion dollars and you're still gonna wear the same clothes, right? I'm gonna be the same way, right? I like to be slightly pretentious mm. with the cars and the shoes and the watches, but I'm like overkill, yeah. where I'm like shopping at Versace every weekend with $40,000, right? Where I'm trying to be someone I'm not, I'm trying to be a big guy. I don't party, I don't drink. So like, I never wanna be surrounded by that level of like, you know, uh, insecurity, that's what yeah, I call sure. it, right? And so, I don't know, I think that's the key to success in this city and to any big city is just be yourself, you know? I mean, cool. I think that's good. That's a good point yeah, to uh, end it on, be yourself. On, I gotta, it. It's like breakfast time. Yeah, I know. You it's know? almost lunch. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, guys, so thank you so much for watching. The other thing you could do besides be yourself is get a free stock down below in the description. Subscribe you to sign Houston, up for he's going to be down below Use the code Graham. You also may as well do that. It's worth Patreon, all the way up guys. to $1,000. I'll be getting back to your messages, okay? So make sure to message us there. <laughs> on time. Thanks so much, yeah. Alex, for producing this podcast, man. You're doing a great job. Make sure to follow me yeah. on Instagram, J-O-S-S-A-O-B-Y. And thank you guys so much for watching, and until next time.